Laurel and Hardy were a comedy duo who rose to fame during the classical Hollywood era. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy's slapstick comedy dominated the 1930s, as they appeared in 107 films, had millions of fans, and even earned an Academy Award. But behind the act were failed marriages, health problems, and financial ruin. Norval Hardy was born in Georgia in 1892. His father, Oliver Hardy, died just a few months after his birth. His mother supported the family by managing hotels and boarding houses. Sometime in his teenage years, Hardy began using the name Oliver in honor of his father. That wasn't the only loss Hardy suffered during his childhood. When he was 17 years old, his older brother Sam visited home, and the brothers decided to go swimming at an old mill dam on the Oconee River. Sam, showing off for his kid brother, climbed a tree and dived into the river from an overhanging branch. Tragically, he misjudged the depth of the water and broke his neck on the rocks below the surface. Oliver Hardy and his friends dived into the river and pulled Sam out. They carried him back to the hotel their mother ran, but it was too late. Sam was dead. Decades later, when Hardy appeared on the television program This Is Your Life, he became very emotional when the subject was brought up, showing just how much of a mark the loss left on the young boy. Stan Laurel was born Arthur Stanley Jefferson in 1890 in England. While Laurel had a relatively happy family life, he was alone a lot as a child. His parents were performers and theater managers, and they frequently traveled. They took their children with them, except Stan, who was weak and sickly as a child. Laurel wound up spending much of his childhood with his grandparents, George and Sarah Metcalf. The Metcalfs were generally kind to Laurel, but they were very strict and he spent much of his time alone in a shack on their property being punished for one thing or another. Still, Laurel grew into a performer just like his parents, and he quickly began writing his own plays and pursued theater. While this initially disappointed his parents, who hoped Laurel would come work with them, they supported his dreams. Come out of there! And put that pipe out! Then, when Stan Laurel was just 18 years old, tragedy struck when his mother Madge died unexpectedly. It's suspected she suffered from a respiratory illness made worse by the air quality in Glasgow, where the family had relocated. Laurel, who had discovered his father was cheating on Madge some years before, blamed his father for breaking his mother's will to live. According to Laurel's second wife, Virginia Ruth Rogers, he was devastated by the loss of his mother and in some ways never recovered from it. Part of the magic that was Laurel and Hardy as a comedy act was their physical disparity. Stan Laurel's weepy, rail-thin figure next to Oliver Hardy's robust frame was inherently charming to audiences. Hardy's weight was part of his identity and also the cause of his health problems later in life. Hardy's weight also caused him grief in his younger days. Throughout his childhood, Hardy was known as Fatty Hardy. Even after he became a famous Hollywood star, locals in his hometown in Georgia referred to him by the cruel nickname. His mother, who managed local boarding houses, made things even worse when she made young Hardy walk around town wearing a sandwich board advertising the food at her hotels. Hardy's size continued to plague him as he got older. When America entered World War I, Oliver Hardy sought to do his patriotic duty and went to a local enlistment office to join the army. However, the officers took one look at Hardy's size and began to make fun of him, calling other recruiters over to look at him. He left humiliated. Laurel and Hardy, the iconic comedy duo, wouldn't exist without Hollywood producer Hal Roach. Both Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel were working actors during the 1920s, but neither had achieved any sort of breakout success. Roach saw their potential and put them together in 1927's The Second Hundred Years. From that point on, the pair rose to stardom under Roach's guidance. But Roach was a sharp businessman, and Laurel and Hardy were not. Roach managed to keep the upper hand through shrewd negotiating. For example, he staggered the expiration dates of their contracts so they could never negotiate as a team, which allowed Roach to consistently undervalue them. He paid them a flat wage instead of a percentage of the profits. Roach also ensured that they never held any of the copyrights or got any screenwriting credits, although they usually took a very active role in the writing and directing of their films. As both men went through several divorces, alimony payments piled up, and Oliver Hardy developed a gambling problem. By the 1950s, Laurel and Hardy had to embark on a live tour of English music halls to try to pay some bills, which failed when Hardy took ill and the tour had to be canceled. Oliver Hardy died surprisingly broke, and New Statesman reveals that in 1946, Stan Laurel was forced to admit that he only had $2,000 in his bank account and $200 a month to live on. For about 14 years, Laurel and Hardy were one of the most popular comedy duos in Hollywood. 
They often took an active role in shaping the films they worked on, writing and introducing physical gags. The comedy duo usually improvised much of their bits, and carefully planned and even directed scenes while working with producer Hal Roach. But over time, Laurel and Hardy grew to despise Roach for his tough negotiating methods and hard-charging business style. Thus, when they finally had the chance to break away from him, they leaped at it, signing new deals with 20th Century Fox and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer in 1941. However, their new deal was not all it was cracked up to be, because with Roach, Laurel and Hardy had enjoyed a great deal of creative control. When they moved to MGM in the 1940s, they were disappointed to find they'd lost that, and they were treated as hired actors, with no input on the scripts or direction. As a result, their output in the 1940s is considered to be of lower quality, and their stars began to fade. The duo made only one film together after 1945, and by 1953, they were broke and out of the film business entirely. Oliver Hardy married his first wife, Madeline, in 1913 when he was just 21 years old. The couple eloped to Macon, Georgia for the nuptials, claiming that since they were both a part of touring troops of actors and musicians, they couldn't wait until they were both home to hold a ceremony. The Hardy family reported that Hardy's mother was enraged at the union because Madeline was older than her son. But as author Simon Luvish writes, the reason for the Hardy family's opposition to the marriage was likely much worse. Madeline was Jewish. Hardy married her far away from his family to avoid an ugly scene, and the couple left Georgia almost immediately. The marriage lasted six years, and Hardy would describe it as a, quote, sham in his divorce application. He married Myrtle Reeves shortly after the divorce was granted, but once again, marital bliss was denied him. As Luvish notes, Reeves was an alcoholic who was forced to stay in a sanitarium several times as she struggled with her disease, leaving Hardy desperate to leave the marriage. He finally found contentment after divorcing Reeves in 1940. He married Virginia Lucille Jones, who remained by his side until his death in 1957. Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel were unique Hollywood comedians in many ways. One of the most surprising was the fact that they were very close friends in real life. They enjoyed a very healthy and balanced professional relationship, wherein Hardy trusted Laurel to shape the material in their films and went along with his ideas. This mutual respect extended to their career dealings as well. When Laurel and Hardy finally got out from under Hal Roach's control in the early 1940s, neither considered working alone. When Hardy died in 1957, Stan Laurel was crushed chose to retire from show business rather than work without his friend of more than 30 years. The final phase of Laurel and Hardy's film career was a lengthy decline. When they switched film studios in the 1940s and lost creative control over their work, the quality of their films declined, and public tastes shifted, leaving them less popular than they'd once been. They were virtually retired by 1945. It's because this comedy is difficult to make, you see. And difficult to do, uh, too. You said. After World War II ended, Laurel and Hardy's celebrity, which had been on the steady decline throughout the 1940s, suddenly took off internationally as their films were finally widely distributed. So it was decided that there was potential to relaunch their film careers with a French-Italian co-production that eventually became known as Atal K. The production was a fiasco. There were language barriers and a terrible script to contend with, but the truly tragic aspect was Laurel and Hardy's health. Hardy was at his heaviest and suffered from heart problems as well as a serious bout of the flu, while Laurel was dealing with diabetes and a prostate condition. Furthermore, both men were considered heavy smokers in an era when smoking was common and accepted, which didn't help their conditions. In a final humiliation, the producers found it impossible to get the film into theaters. In the end, the final film of Laurel and Hardy was a sad end to their brilliant careers. It was fun while it lasted, wasn't it, Stan? Oliver Hardy's weight caused him many health concerns over the course of his life, and by the 1950s, he finally decided to do something about it. So he embarked on a crash diet that led to a weight loss of 150 pounds. Hardy expected people to be supportive, but as author Simon Luvish says, the change in his appearance was so drastic that friends and family were visibly upset at the sight of him. This bothered Hardy terribly, and he went into near seclusion, seeing only a short list of trusted friends, including Stan Laurel. Then, in September 1956, Oliver Hardy suffered a massive stroke that left him paralyzed and mute. He was unable to concentrate on anything or communicate effectively with the people around him. When he became especially agitated or depressed, his wife would invite Stan to visit. He lingered on for almost a year, being diagnosed with cancer and suffering an additional two strokes before dying in August 1957. By the 1950s, Stan Laurel had been struggling with his own health. Laurel had chronic problems with his prostate and had to have an ulcer surgically removed from his prostate. 
He was also a diabetic, which complicated his health. Laurel had a stroke in 1955, which he survived, but it left him weak. When Oliver Hardy died in 1957, Laurel quietly retired and moved into a small apartment in Santa Monica with his wife Ida. He spent his final years as a lonely man who passed his time writing letters, possibly thousands of them. Laurel spent hours every day corresponding with anyone he could, faithfully answering fan letters and sending missives off to his acquaintances. Some of these letters reveal tragic facts, as when he writes that after his stroke, quote, of course I shall never be in a condition to work anymore. Even more tragic was the fact that Stan Laurel penned something other than letters during his final years. He also wrote comedy routines designed for Laurel and Hardy, routines that would never be performed. As New Statesman notes, it was almost as if it was Laurel's way of staying in touch with Hardy. Where did TV legend Lucille Ball's money go after she died? And how did her personal letters wind up in the hands of a pro golfer? Let's find out. Although she is perhaps best known today for her groundbreaking sitcom series, I Love Lucy, there's plenty more to say about comedy icon Lucille Ball. Thanks to Desilu Productions, she was also the first woman to run a major Hollywood studio. Alongside her husband, Desi Arnaz, she broke ground by depicting one of the first interracial couples on television. Ball and Arnaz first met on a film set back in 1940 and eloped soon after. Years later, when CBS approached her about developing her own show, she wouldn't do it unless Arnaz played her on-screen husband. The network reluctantly agreed, and a sitcom legend was born. However, the union between Ball and Arnaz did not last, though I Love Lucy shows otherwise. The pair's relationship was filled with infidelity and drinking on his part. When their TV relationship had run its course, they divorced in 1960, putting an end to 20 tumultuous years of marriage. Ball cited extreme cruelty and mental suffering as the cause. But despite their divorce and subsequent new partners, Ball and Arnaz remained close. She went on to marry comedian Gary Morton in 1961, and they stayed together until her death in 1989. After struggling with fertility issues in the 1940s, Ball and Arnaz eventually had two children together. She gave birth to their daughter Lucy in 1951 and her son Desi Jr. in 1953. In fact, her pregnancy with her son was even written into I Love Lucy. According to Time magazine, the network was initially against the idea. However, by excluding the word pregnancy from the storyline, Ball and Arnaz were eventually allowed to incorporate it into the script. I heard you sing a number called We're Having a Baby, My Baby and Me. If you will sing it for us now, it will be my way of breaking the news to him. Her son was born on the same day that the birth episode of I Love Lucy aired on CBS. But what was the iconic redhead like as a mother? In an interview with KCRW in 2021, Lucy Arnaz said that her mom was always struggling to find ways to relate to her own kids. And of course, by the time she had children, Ball was already in her 40s. Not to mention, she was a successful and extremely busy entertainment personality. Lucy Arnaz also noted in her conversation with KCRW that her mother went so far as to ask other celebrities, including Debbie Reynolds, for parenting advice. She believes that Ball didn't know how to be a parent since her own father had died when she was four, and her mother, who worked to support the family, was gone most of the day. She described her mother as, quote, flying blind when it came to parenting. In another interview with WTOP, Lucy Arnaz stressed that while both she and her brother had a luxurious childhood, what they really wanted was more time with their working parents. Despite this, she emphasized that her folks truly loved each other and were creative geniuses. Lucille Ball was 77 when she died of a ruptured aorta on April 27, 1989, leaving behind an estate worth an estimated $40 million. The inheritance was split among her two children, Lucy Arnaz and Desi Arnaz Jr., and her second husband, Gary Morton. Seven years after Ball's death, Morton went on to marry a professional golfer named Susie McAllister. That marriage, however, was short-lived, as he died three years later. With Morton gone, his portion of Ball's inheritance went to McAllister. In 2010, more than a decade after Morton's death, Heritage Auctions announced that McAllister was parting ways with Ball's estate items because she was remodeling her home. Some of those items included jewelry, awards, love letters, art, and even a Rolls Royce. This, of course, did not sit well with Ball's children, especially Lucy Arnaz, who threatened legal action to stop the auction. McAllister responded by filing a suit. According to Danielle and Andy Mayoras, the judge ruled he would stop the sale only if Arnaz could post a $250,000 bond. She did not have the money, however. Heritage Auctions later agreed to return Ball's awards to Arnaz, who planned to donate them to a museum. McAllister went on to sell the rest of the items, including the love letters and the car. They reportedly brought in over $230,000.
Schlitzie the Pinhead was one of the most famous circus sideshow acts ever. His unusual appearance attracted swarms of audiences, but his life was incredibly hard behind the scenes. Schlitzie's most recognizable feature was his small head, the result of a disorder called microcephaly. People with this condition have skulls that are far smaller than a typical skull, and they're often conical toward the crown of the head. That much is clear. The truth is that microcephaly can be a symptom of several other issues. It can be due to genetics, fetal alcohol syndrome, the Zika virus, or a number of other problems. While sources say that Schlitzy was born with microcephaly, others say that he developed a condition later on. His body grew, but his head didn't. Each of these possibilities can indicate different causes, so it's unclear exactly how Schlitzy came to be microcephalic. It doesn't seem that he was ever seriously examined by any doctor, and medicine in the early 20th century was far more rudimentary than it is now, so it's likely that doctors wouldn't have been able to find out anything anyway, especially without a family or medical history or any other information to go on. Since we know next to nothing about Schlitzie's birth, we also don't know much about his childhood, other than his last name was probably Surtees. Some sources say that his parents kept him either in an attic or a basement, but one thing we can be pretty sure of is that Schlitzie's parents probably sold him to the circus. Decades after slavery was outlawed, selling a child with a disability was not exactly legal, but people certainly looked the other way. Schlitzie went on to work for just about every popular circus that existed during his lifetime, including big names like Barnum & Bailey and Ringling Brothers, as he was traded, sold, and lent to various circus owners. This was actually common practice at the time, despite how horrifying it sounds. Because circuses typically followed a specific route of cities each year, the owners wanted to keep things fresh, and so they would frequently swap out attractions in hope of bringing new customers to cities they had been to before. This meant that sideshow performers often moved between circuses and constantly visited new cities. While performers who were more able-minded might have had some say in this, those with intellectual disabilities like Schlitzy likely had no choice whatsoever. Because of Schlitzy's cognitive difficulties, it's said that he behaved a lot like an excitable child. He had a sense of wonder and joy that audiences loved and kept them coming back to see him. He could sing, dance, and even parrot people, and audiences ate it all up. One of his most popular acts was quite simple. He would count from 1 to 10, though it's said that he would often skip the number 7. It's not certain if Schlitzie had trouble remembering it or if it was part of the act and he skipped it on purpose for laughs. But audiences weren't the only ones upon whom Schlitzie left a mark. His nurses and caregivers are said to have loved him, and fellow performers were also very fond of him and made sure he was taken care of. While he never had a family per se, the circuses he worked for made sure to treat him as family. On the occasions that audiences were cruel to Schlitzie, the other circus workers would quickly stop the abusive audience members and make them leave. Schlitzie's most famous acting appearance was in the 1932 horror film Freaks, in which he effectively played himself. However, the movie Schlitzie was female both on stage and off. He gets a good amount of screen time, and his performance is a great way for modern audiences to experience his personality and see his charm in action. I wish you a man I was just in my time then. Why, Schlitzie, what's the matter? And this wasn't Schlitzie's only film role. He played a sideshow performer in 1928's The Sideshow and 1941's Meet Boston Blackie, and he appeared in 1932's The Island of Lost Souls early adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel The Island of Dr. Moreau, as one of the manimals. But his most unusual role came in the exploitation film Tomorrow's Children, which was meant to showcase the evils of forced sterilization, common practice at the time for criminals or those with disabilities. Schlitzie has a brief role as a criminal sentenced to sterilization, and unusually for him, he appears with a full head of hair and a beard. One sad truth about sideshow performers is that many of them had shorter than average lives. Schlitzy was actually one of the exceptions to this. He died on September 24, 1971, and according to his own death certificate, he lived to the age of 70. However, that birth date is unconfirmed, so it's possible that Schlitzy was older, possibly even in his 80s when he passed away. His cause of death was listed as bronchial pneumonia brought on by medullary depression. Schlitzie was quite poor at the end of his life, and thus he wasn't able to afford a grave marker. In 2007, a Schlitzie fan named Scott Michaels visited Schlitzie's grave in California. He remarked upon the lack of a gravestone on his website, so members of the site's message board decided to see what they could do about the situation. 
One of them called up Queen of Heaven's Cemetery and found out there was a balance that needed to be paid off and that a new marker could be placed there. So the site's members held a little fundraiser, and after raising a few hundred dollars, Schlitzie's balance was paid, and a small, ground-level marker was added to the plot. Rock Hudson was best known for his dashing looks and roles in Giant and All the Heaven Allows. Behind Rock Hudson's fame was a troubled childhood, a manipulative Hollywood agent, and a struggle with his gay identity. He was also the first major celebrity to die with AIDS in 1985. Rock Hudson didn't have the easiest start in life. Born Roy Harold Shearer Jr. in Winneka, Illinois, Hudson's father abandoned him and his mother when Hudson was still a child. His mother later remarried a man named Wallace Fitzgerald. Hudson's new stepfather adopted the eight-year-old Roy, giving him the last name Fitzgerald. One would think it would be indicative of some paternal feeling towards the boy. However, this turned out not to be the case. Wallace Fitzgerald was brutal toward his stepson, especially when the young Roy first revealed his interest in becoming an actor. Hudson learned early in life just how dangerous it could be to express his true thoughts and feelings. Hudson later enlisted in the U.S. Navy during World War II and served from 1944 to 1946. After he was discharged, he moved to Hollywood and took a paying job as a truck driver. He lingered around movie studios during the day, hoping to be noticed by executives or talent agents. The young Roy Fitzgerald, as Rock Hudson was then known, did get his wish and was discovered by Hollywood talent agent Henry Wilson. Wilson was quite taken with Roy's dashing good looks and imposing 6'4 height. However, the talent agent had a very shady reputation in the Hollywood world. It was also a semi-open secret that Henry Wilson was gay. And while he was good at producing actors, it was also known that Wilson usually recruited young, handsome, and inexperienced aspiring actors like Hudson. Rock Hudson and Henry Wilson actually had a lot in common, seeing as both were gay men with abusive fathers. Wilson's father even sent him to an all-male boarding school when he was young, hoping the school would make his son more manly. Once Wilson recruited him, Roy Fitzgerald had to completely remake his image, with Henry Wilson's help, of course. Wilson was actually the one who gave his client his new name, Rock Hudson. He was given the first name Rock for the Rock of Gibraltar and the last name Hudson for the Hudson River. Given that Hudson's legal last name up until that point had been his abusive stepfather's, he probably wasn't too regretful about giving it up. But Wilson knew that Hudson needed more than a name change to be a convincing leading man. It was clear that Hudson was gay, but that couldn't be made obvious to studio executives or the public. Luckily, Hudson already had the height, the good looks, and the naivete. Wilson could work with all of that. According to Vanity Fair, Wilson personally paid for an extensive makeover for Hudson. This included getting Hudson's teeth capped, buying him a new wardrobe, and sending him for vocal lessons. Wilson even taught Hudson how to exude an exaggerated masculinity. In essence, Henry Wilson can be credited with creating the cinematic image of the Rock Hudson the public recognized. Surprisingly enough, Rock Hudson was actually not that great an actor in the beginning. He had no professional experience or training as an actor when he first arrived in Hollywood. However, others were willing to take a chance on him because of his stunning, all-American good looks and imposing height. Before signing with Henry Wilson, Hudson would apparently pose outside of the studio gates hoping to catch a higher-up's attention with his handsomeness or send photos of himself to producers. Even Henry Wilson couldn't deny that Hudson's primary talents, at least in the beginning, were his striking good looks. According to Vanity Fair, after laying eyes on Hudson, Wilson was said to have declared, quote, The acting can be added later. Once Hudson was signed, he was given acting and vocal lessons. His debut role in 1948 was a bit part in the movie Fighter Squadron. However, as noted by the Radio Times, there were rumors that it took 38 takes for Hudson to deliver his one simple line in the film successfully. Peg, I won't let you do it. You know you love you, and you know I won't let me throw it all away. Sorry, I screwed it up. Can I try it again? In fact, for the rest of his acting career, Hudson was notorious for his problems with learning his lines. Despite his struggles, they didn't stop him from starring in the 1956 film Giant, a role that earned him a Best Actor Oscar nomination. Homosexuality was never portrayed on the big screen during the old Hollywood days, but many of Hudson's roles often depicted a man in the midst of an identity crisis, like Magnificent Obsession and All That Heaven Allows, both of which were directed by Douglas Sirk. Sirk was one of Hudson's regular directors and seemed keenly aware of Hudson's personal struggles with identity. He likely urged Hudson to do these roles. And I've always been trusting my audience to have imagination, otherwise they should stay out of the cinema. Given how Hudson grappled with pretending to be a completely different person in public, he was most effective in these film roles. Douglas Sirk and Rock Hudson worked together several times, and they both had a close friendship. According to an article in the Criterion Collection, Hudson described his bond with Sirk as very much a father-son type of relationship. He was like old dad to me, and I was like a son to him, I think. Hudson was about the same age as Sirk's son, whom he lost custody to in a divorce after his ex-wife joined the Nazi party. 
and Hudson had never had a close paternal figure in his life, so Cirque was certainly a welcome change. Although Henry Wilson was instrumental in starting Hudson's career, working with him came at a hefty price. Wilson's reputation had never been the greatest, but by the 1960s it was getting even worse. Besides being a notorious alcoholic, excessively vicious and cruel, rumors of Wilson's quote gay casting couch were circulating. Studios became increasingly more reluctant to sign his clients. Hudson stood by Wilson and continued to have a professional and personal relationship with him for years, but by 1966, Wilson was becoming a weight around his neck. Hudson then fired him. Hudson had been Wilson's most profitable client, and without him, Wilson didn't have much to work with. He would continue to spiral downward into poverty and ill health. According to Vanity Fair, when his health was extremely bad and the money had run out, Wilson begged Hudson for financial help. Hudson wrote a check for $20,000 and said that was all he owed Henry Wilson and no more. Wilson died in 1978 of cirrhosis of the liver. By then, he was completely destitute. There wasn't even enough money for a headstone at his grave. For years, Henry Wilson was nameless in his plot until someone finally paid for a headstone to be made. Prior to his diagnosis with AIDS, Rock Hudson was already starting to develop severe health problems in the early 80s. Hudson was a heavy smoker and drinker, which were likely the main contributors to his issues. In the 1980s, Hudson had switched gears and was now acting on television. In 1982, when starring on the short-lived detective show The Devlin Connection, Hudson had a massive heart attack that shut down production. He subsequently had to have quadruple bypass surgery. I will not be sick. I will not be dependent upon anybody else. By the time Hudson recovered from surgery and filming resumed, viewers lost interest in the Devlin connection and the show was canceled. Rock Hudson's last major role was on the soap opera Dynasty. He was intended to be a leading character, but soon it became obvious that his health was failing him. Hudson was becoming increasingly frailer, losing weight, and soon his speech began to suffer. After appearing on 14 episodes of Dynasty, Hudson's character had to be written off the show. As an A-list Hollywood star, Rock Hudson would always be in the public eye, but he tried to avoid the limelight whenever possible, including interviews. In one of his rare interviews in the 80s with journalist Randa Handler, Handler inquired about his reluctance to give interviews. Hudson responded by blaming his interview shyness on worries about being misquoted. While there is certainly some truth to this, most likely Rock Hudson found interviews particularly stressful due to diminished control. For decades, he had to play a very specific, carefully crafted role for the public, and a curveball question from an interviewer could throw off the facade, which meant he risked exposure. Rock Hudson was diagnosed with AIDS in 1984. He had originally visited a dermatologist to have a blemish on his neck examined. The blemish turned out to be a form of cancer typically found in AIDS patients. This meant he had an obligation to contact his recent former lovers to inform them of his illness. However, Hudson was still wary about exposing his identity and outing himself as gay. Instead, his close friend George Nader handled the process for him by sending out anonymous letters, which, according to USA Today, stated the following, We recently had sex together and I have been informed by my doctor that I may have AIDS. Please go to your doctor and have a checkup. Nader posted the letters from his home in Palm Springs to prevent anyone from tracing them back to Hudson and compromising him. Despite their best efforts to protect Hudson, one of the recipients, a 22-year-old man, guessed the letter writer's actual identity. After being diagnosed with AIDS himself, the young man sold his story to a tabloid for $10,000 before dying six months later. Hudson eventually came out publicly in 1985 about his AIDS diagnosis and identity as a gay man. He was one of the first celebrities to discuss his homosexuality and his diagnosis with the deadly disease. It ended up being a huge turning point in bringing greater awareness about the AIDS epidemic. Before, AIDS was publicly dismissed as a, quote, gay disease and not regarded as seriously as it needed to be. But once Rock Hudson came out, everything changed. Now there was an identifiable human face for the disease. It can be considered disappointing that it took a celebrity getting diagnosed with AIDS, a sickness that was already killing many, in order for it to be given proper attention, but it did the trick. Hudson's old celebrity friends like Elizabeth Taylor and Doris Day stood by him, while people from all over began supporting AIDS benefits and fundraisers. In a 1985 interview with People, Joan Rivers admitted that Rock Hudson's coming out did wonders for AIDS support, telling the magazine, Two years ago, when I hosted a benefit for AIDS, I couldn't get one major star to turn out. Rock's admission is a horrendous way to bring AIDS to the attention of the American public, but by doing so, Rock and his life has helped millions in the process. Rock Hudson passed away at the age of 59 on October 2, 1985. He was able to live out the remainder of his life surrounded by close friends. While Hudson was fortunate to have a support system at the end of his life, he never was able to have true love. His career in public life wouldn't permit it. Before his death, Hudson revealed to biographer Sarah Davidson that stockbroker Lee Garlington was his, quote, real true love. 
The two dated in the mid-60s, but had to keep their relationship a secret, or it would have meant career suicide for both of them. This involved taking secret trips together away from the press's prying eyes and attending Hollywood events together with women as their official dates. But Hudson's career in the public eye wouldn't allow them to stay together for the long haul. During a recent interview with People, Garlington expressed his regret that they couldn't have been together in today's more accepting world, telling the magazine, I wish he had been born 30 or 40 years later. He'd be more relaxed and at ease, and it would have been a happier life. He'd also be elated by how much has changed. The feud between sisters Joan Fontaine and Olivia de Havilland was the longest running in Hollywood history, spanning almost an entire century of sights, spite, and sniping in the press. But why? Keep watching to find out. Both Betty Davis and Joan Crawford were Hollywood heavyweights during its golden age. The feud between the two leading ladies has become Tinseltown lore, as they tirelessly threw jabs at one another in what was ultimately a clash of egos. Davis and Crawford's rivalry kicked off in 1933. Crawford was already considered an A-list star, while Davis was still making a name for herself, having finally scored a leading role in Ex Lady. According to Joan Crawford, Hollywood martyr, Davis was thrilled at the possibility of newspapers promoting the flick as front-page news. But Crawford's announcement that she was divorcing her first husband, movie star Douglas Fairbanks Jr., suddenly took center stage. Ultimately, publications gave scant reviews of Ex Lady, while Crawford's personal drama snagged multiple pages. The moment sparked a feud between the two women that lasted four decades, with jabs both professional and personal being hurled both ways. The pair did end up starring in a movie together in 1962 for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. According to the biography Not the Girl Next Door, it was Crawford who reached out to Davis, knowing that she would be perfect for the film. Their time on set was anything but professional, with Davis even accusing Crawford of intentionally injuring her while they filmed the scene. Elizabeth Taylor and Debbie Reynolds' legendary spat was due to a love triangle, which resulted in the two not speaking for years. Reynolds and Taylor met when they were teens and both signed to MGM. The pair remained friends as they grew into adulthood, with Reynolds marrying Eddie Fisher in 1955 and Taylor tying the knot with Mike Todd two years later, with Reynolds serving as the matron of honor. Sadly, Taylor's marital bliss was cut short in 1958 after Todd tragically died in a plane crash. Curiously enough, it was Fisher who immediately ran to Taylor's side to console her, and a mere month later, he separated from Reynolds. While the press had a field day with the news, Taylor and Reynolds' friendship came to a halt. Decades later, in 2010, Reynolds revealed to the Daily Mail that she believed Taylor's affair with Fisher actually began in 1957, when he was away touring. A lonely Reynolds phoned her friend and was horrified to hear her husband on the other line. Fisher ended up marrying Taylor, and the two women didn't speak for years, even after Taylor and Fisher divorced. According to Closer Weekly, seven years after Taylor betrayed her friend, the two finally reconciled after discovering they were stuck together on a ship heading from New York to England, with Reynolds extending the olive branch. Jerry Lewis was a huge part of Dean Martin's climb to the top of the A-list, in 1946, Martin was a nightclub singer when he met Lewis after a performance. The pair hit it off, and their comedy act was born the following year. They were so popular together, the duo made an incredible 16 films together between the years of 1949 and 1956. However, behind closed doors, the situation was less than stellar. Martin was tired of being just the straight man to Lewis's wacky antics while Lewis detested that his partner in crime didn't have the same workaholic mentality as he did. A significant point of contention came in 1954, when Look Magazine cropped Martin out of a promotional photo for their new movie, Living It Up. Things never recovered after that, and by 1956, Lewis and Martin had gone their separate ways. According to People, the two refused to speak to one another for a whopping 20 years until their mutual friend, Frank Sinatra, attempted a live, surprise onstage reunion in 1976. Although they were civil for the cameras, it would be another 10 years before they truly reconciled, after Martin's son passed away in a plane crash in 1987. When Martin died in 1995, Lewis took the blame for their bitter split all those decades ago. He told TCM's Ben Mankiewicz that Martin was the best man he ever met. 
you still thought of him as your best friend? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yes. When Jane Mansfield finally reached the A-list in the late 1950s, Marilyn Monroe was already a bona fide Hollywood icon. The pair were already on bad terms before they even met. According to the Vintage News, Mansfield was considered by many a cheaper knockoff version of Monroe, which clearly irked Marilyn. So annoyed was Monroe with her rival that she once snapped at writer Lawrence J. Quirk. All she does is imitate me. I wish I had some legal means to sue her. After a confused Quirk asked her why she would want to take legal action against Mansfield, Monroe said, quote, for degrading the image. But it wasn't just Mansfield's copycat behavior that annoyed Monroe. As Quirk notes, Mansfield purportedly took note of her rival's alleged affair with John F. Kennedy and decided she wanted a slice of presidential pie too. Utilizing the help of JFK's brother-in-law, Peter Lawford, Mansfield had her own secret tryst with Kennedy, later telling Lawford, everyone in Hollywood and Washington knows about it anyway. I'll bet Marilyn's pissed. The feud between Frank Sinatra and Marlon Brando began in 1954, when Brando snagged the lead part in On the Waterfront, a role that Sinatra was gunning for himself. Although there wasn't any bad blood from Brando's side, biographer James Kaplan told Closer Weekly that, quote, Frank detested the ground that Brando walked on. When the pair became co-stars the following year for the musical comedy Guys and Dolls, things only worsened, and Brando started antagonizing old Blue Eyes. During a scene where Sinatra was eating cheesecake, Brando would purposely mess up his lines. The result? Sinatra would have to keep eating for multiple takes on end. Don't think I am a pest, but do yourself a favor. Eat this last little bite of cheesecake. You will thank me. The breaking point came when Sinatra's estranged wife, Ava Gardner, decided to visit Brando in his dressing room, sending Sinatra into an alleged jealous rage. According to the book Brando Unzipped, Brando was kidnapped by three men who forced him into a car and threatened to kill him at gunpoint for two hours. After Brando was released, he was convinced that Sinatra, who had alleged mafia ties, was behind it. Bud Abbott and Lou Costello are considered comedy legends. The winning formula for the duo was the roles they played. Abbott, who acted as more of a straight man, was the serious schemer, while Costello played the more childlike comedic role. While this made for some phenomenal on-screen chemistry, the two men grew to hate one another off-camera. In 1945, nine years after teaming up, their relationship soured when Abbott hired a maid that had formerly worked for Costello. This resulted in Costello telling the tabloids that Abbott was a drunk, while Abbott himself publicly declared he'd get physical with his on-screen chum. Under their contracts, Abbott and Costello were forced to keep working together, but they didn't speak to each other when cameras weren't rolling. Their most serious row happened in 1957, after Errol Flynn played a practical joke on the pair and their families by inviting them for a film screening and instead playing a very adult movie. Flynn pretended he had no idea how the movies got switched, so Abbott and Costello blamed each other for the tasteless joke, leading to their final breakup. Jane Mansfield's climb to Tinseltown's A-list was an interesting one, mainly because her critics didn't exactly think she was that good of an actor. Considered by The Hollywood Reporter as the first star to be famous for being famous, Mansfield knew how to use the tabloids to her advantage. One of Mansfield's most well-known publicity stunts involved the celebrated actor Sophia Loren, which allegedly irked the Italian star so much, it turned her off Hollywood as a whole. In 1957, Loren visited Hollywood, attending a press event in her honor. After Loren had been seated at the table, Mansfield crashed the party. As she leaned over Loren's table, Mansfield suffered a wardrobe malfunction, grabbing headlines as much for Loren's side eye as for Mansfield herself. Many newspapers and magazines reportedly published photos from the event with the words censored covering Mansfield's bosom. Decades later, Loren told Entertainment Weekly, I'm staring at her nipples because I'm afraid they're about to come onto my plate. If she moves, everything moves and it's a disaster. <laughs> After Mansfield's tragic death in 1967 though, Loren would always decline to autograph copies of the photo out of respect for Mansfield. Orson Welles released his magnum opus, Citizen Kane, in 1941. It's now considered one of the greatest films of all time. 
but it completely flopped at the time of its release thanks to newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst. The titular character of Charles Foster Kane was said to have been inspired in part by Hearst. Hearst was so offended by the on-screen portrayal that he prohibited newspapers from mentioning the movie and banned movie theaters from showing it. In 1970, Wells told Dick Cavett that the Hearsts tried to keep the movie from ever being seen at all. They tried to have it destroyed, they even tried to frame me. Hearst died in 1951, while Wells passed away in 1985. The feud seems to have died with them. In 2015, Hearst's great-grandson Stephen Hearst gave permission to screen Citizen Kane in the private movie theater at Hearst Castle. Stephen Hearst told NPR that reporters questioned him about how his ancestor would have felt. One of them said, do you think your great-grandfather would be rolling in his grave? And I let him know that based on my current responsibilities. I also have control of the mausoleum, and if necessary, I can check. The feud between Joan Fontaine and Olivia de Havilland goes past a Hollywood squabble. It was a familial rivalry. The sisters were born a mere 15 months apart, and their competitiveness reportedly began while they were still children. Joan, the younger of the two, believed that their mother preferred Olivia, so the pair often fought. Their altercations ranged from small slaps to one occasion when Olivia broke her sister's collarbone trying to pull her into a pool. Disturbingly, Joan revealed in an interview with Life magazine in 1942 that when she was nine, she plotted to kill her sister if Olivia kept hitting her, a plan that luckily didn't come to fruition. By 1938, Dee Havilland was an established star while Fontaine struggled to catch up. Their feud only escalated when Fontaine took a job as her sister's chauffeur to make ends meet. Then they became professional rivals, as the only siblings to both win an Oscar in a leading acting category. The two eventually stopped speaking to each other entirely after their mother's death in 1975. In 1978, Fontaine told The Hollywood Reporter, I married first, won the Oscar before Olivia did, and if I die first, She'll undoubtedly be livid because I beat her to it. None of us are warm and cozy. It's not in our natures. Ultimately, they had the longest running feud in Hollywood history. Fontaine died in 2013 at the age of 96, while Dee Havilland died in 2020 at the age of 104. They reportedly never reconciled. German director Werner Herzog and actor Klaus Kinski produced some incredible films together, having collaborated five times. The pair knew each other since they were teens, as Herzog met Kinski when he moved into his apartment building. When they began working together, though, their professional relationship was messy and volatile. Although their movies were legendary, so were their spats off-camera. The most turbulent flick the pair worked on together was 1972's Aguirre, The Wrath of God, which took place in Peru. By this point in Kinski's career, he was already well-known for being an incredibly difficult actor to work with. And let's just say the intense jungle filming didn't lead to much harmony on set. There is some sort of a harmony. It is the harmony of overwhelming and collective murder. Herzog later recalled that when Kinski decided to just walk off the movie, Herzog bluntly told him, If you leave the set now, you will reach the bend. The next bend of the river and I will shoot you. We'll have eight bullets through your head. Kinski stayed but his dramatic antics during the filming of Aguirre didn't irk Herzog alone. According to The Guardian, at one point, the native Peruvians playing extras in the film actually offered to kill Kinski for Herzog, which he thankfully declined. When The Wizard of Oz came out, not everyone was a fan. In fact, one prominent film critic decried the movie for what he termed vulgarity. Why? Keep watching to find out. When The Wizard of Oz made its official world premiere in a limited preview run in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin on August 12, 1939, it was a big deal. Or rather, an even bigger deal than usual. Back then, a night at the movies was already an event, as movie theaters were often palatial, from ornate art deco facades to the plush seats and carpets under glittering chandeliers. Still, moviegoers who went to see The Wizard of Oz knew it was an extra special event. Catherine Bruckridge told Wisconsin News Channel WISN 12 that she was an awestruck teenager dazzled by the lights and commotion when she attended the movie's world premiere at the Strand Theater. 
She said that everyone was dressed up as if they had been invited to a Hollywood gala, and people were eagerly buzzing around with excitement. The film completely sold out each of the five nights it played at the Strand, and it received similar attention at other theaters in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and Dennis, Massachusetts. Word spread and by the time the movie was officially released on August 25th, it had already become something of a phenomenon. We just want to be clear. There is some controversy as to where the real, very first showing of Wizard of Oz was. But regardless, it wasn't in New York or LA, or even Kansas. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Much of the buzz around The Wizard of Oz didn't come just from word of mouth, though. A lot of it was due to an extensive marketing campaign. Just the circus-style movie posters were enough to generate excitement for the film, making claims such as it took two years just to plan it and startling balloon ascent. Even details about the costumes and special effects were blasted onto some of the posters just to emphasize how unbelievable they were. Entire articles were written in magazines and newspapers as advertisements. MGM spent a massive amount buying ad space in every publication it possibly could, printing full-color Kodachrome cover art. Merch also appeared in some unusual places. In her History of T-Shirts, branding expert Alyssa Mertes notes that the first promotional T-Shirt ever was made for The Wizard of Oz. You can actually see it in the movie, made by Haynes and emblazoned with Oz in bold white. The shirt can be seen on three Emerald City beauticians giving the Scarecrow a makeover by refilling his stuffing. In the weeks following the smash premiere at the Strand Theater, The Wizard of Oz opened in theaters nationwide. As the Los Angeles Times noted, most critics were ooing and eyeing over the spectacle of the film itself and its individual performances, especially Burt Law's antics as the Cowardly Lion and rising star Judy Garland's haunting rendition of Over the Rainbow. Some theatergoers who attended early showings in New York City got an extra surprise. Garland and other cast members actually made appearances in person to help promote the film. Needless to say, tickets were hard to come by. Though 1937's Snow White had paved the way for color films, making movies in color were still very uncommon in 1939. In fact, The Wizard of Oz was one of the earliest live-action movies to be shot in Technicolor. Scenes in The Land of Oz were filmed with eight Technicolor cameras and used a Technicolor machine in theaters, which needed a trained attendant to operate it. Those who saw The Wizard of Oz during its first run remember the saturated colors as one of the things that stood out the most. Catherine Buckridge recalled to WISN 12, That was very impressive because we had never seen color before. If you went to the movies often in the 1930s, you would have been used to sepia tones. Now, imagine suddenly being dazzled by the realm Dorothy steps into once her house crash lands in Oz. For the first time, you would see flowers blooming in every shade of the rainbow, the Wicked Witch of the West at her greenest, and those famous ruby slippers dazzling in the sunlight. Judy Garland was already on her way to stardom before the film that forever transformed her. Burt Lahr, Jack Haley, Ray Bolger, and the film's other stars were already recognizable during that era. There was only one mask used in the movie, for Ray Bolger as the Scarecrow. An original program given out at the Hollywood premiere states that makeup artists made sure viewers could easily tell who the actors were underneath. Fans at the time would have probably recognized Burt Lahr from starring in 1938's Just Around the Corner opposite pint-sized starlet Shirley Temple. Despite the heaps of makeup and fur that went into transforming him into the cowardly lion, you can definitely tell that it's his face under there. Jack Haley, the Tin Man, had also starred alongside Temple in Poor Little Rich Girl and Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, both of which preceded The Wizard of Oz. He'd also previously starred with Garland in Pigskin Parade during her rise to fame in 1936. Movie fans of the time would have certainly recognized most of the stars, stars who became forever linked with their Wizard of Oz roles. That is the original hat that I wore in the picture of The Wizard of Oz. You want me to put it on? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Even in an era long before music streaming, Over the Rainbow and We're Off to See the Wizard were instant hits. Over the Rainbow soon became one of the most demanded songs on the radio. What is now considered one of the greatest soundtracks of all time appealed to listeners from the beginning thanks to its whimsy. The wistful sadness of Over the Rainbow also resonated with audiences who could use something to take them far, far away from the hard times of the Depression. While We're Off to See the Wizard was catchy enough for critics and casual viewers alike to be skipping along to it. The songs from the film were so memorable that they played an undeniable role in the film becoming a cultural icon. 
Some, especially over the rainbow, were both a return to innocence and a form of expression in a time of need. According to Raymond Knapp in the American musical and the performance of Personal Identity, Ding Dong the Witch is Dead vented the anger and frustration that had built up after the massive stock market crash, which all but broke the human spirit during the bleak 1930s. Judy Garland was instantly dubbed America's sweetheart in the afterglow of her star performance as Dorothy. Legions of little girls wanted to be just like Dorothy. As Roger Ebert said in his analysis of The Wizard of Oz, there was just something about the way Garland played the character, who was courageous but still compassionate and vulnerable, which appealed to viewers both then and now. Garland became such an icon that every girl's dream was to have something, maybe even memorabilia from the movie, autographed by her. Oz Museum has recounted the story, which has now become a legend, about a young girl in a Santa Ana hospital who was obsessed with the Wizard of Oz. In her sleep, she would call out to Dorothy. Her heartbroken mother wrote Garland a letter asking if she could send her daughter an autographed photo, but the actress went above and beyond the rainbow. According to the story, she visited the hospital, some say in her Dorothy costume, to sign an autograph in person. The Wizard of Oz was an escape for those weary from the Depression. The desolation of the era was part of the reason why everything that transpired at the Gale family farm was filmed in dreary black and white. There was more symbolism too. Miss Gulch, the richest woman in the county, and her wicked witch alter ego symbolized the greed, evil, and oppression of the era. And the wizard? Just a con man, a character who the Hollywood Reporter said was quote, rich and humorous innuendo. But history goes further, comparing the wizard to President Herbert Hoover, whose big promises to relieve the depression were mostly empty. From Dorothy's homesickness to the laments of the scarecrow, tin man, and lion seeking a brain, a heart, and courage, there were countless elements of the Wizard of Oz that proved there was humanity in a world that was otherwise imaginary. Most reviews for The Wizard of Oz were absolutely glowing. One film critic writing for the Dallas Morning News said it was the best movie MGM had produced in years, adding that he personally thought it was up there with Disney's Snow White. Critics were also mystified over how the studio managed to pull off things like Dorothy picking an apple from an angry tree that snatches the apple right back. Sure, the tree was just an actor in a rubber suit that zipped up in the back, as the Dallas Morning News critic revealed, but the magic was in the suspension of disbelief. Each one had a man inside to make the limbs move, and here's one of the special effects guys now coming up for air. Though Variety critic John C. Flynn noted that some liberties had been taken with L. Frank Baum's novel, he also found himself enchanted. Even though the plot was quite straightforward, Flynn and other critics thought that the performances and effects elevated the movie and exceeded their already high expectations. Not every critic was a fan, though. When Russell Maloney composed his review for The New Yorker, he revealed that he was having a hard time even reviewing the film because it was so garish. He elaborated, The vulgarity of which I was conscious is difficult to analyze. Reason for Maloney's reaction included special effects that he found more aggravating than amusing. The Technicolor, in his opinion, was overdone to the point that you could hardly watch what was happening on screen. Then there was his gripe about the Wicked Witch. It has more to do with the wizard's reaction to her demise, but that was just one of the many gags he absolutely did not find amusing. Maloney was even convinced that Bert Lars' Cowardly Lion had no place in Oz. He thought there was no imagination in a film that was meant to capture the imagination. In a recent survey of contemporary reviews, the Los Angeles Times noted that many critics of the time were put off by the more modern elements used in the film, such as the Wicked Witch of the West using her broom to skywrite Surrender Dorothy above the Emerald City. Critic Otis Ferguson, who reviewed the movie for The New Republic, believed that the film was trying too hard to emulate the success of Snow White. He didn't appreciate the humor, though he did believe that the film would be appealing to kids because of the flashy effects and joyful tunes. William Stillman, co-author of The Wizardry of Oz, told the Los Angeles Times that The Wizard of Oz sold out in theaters, with around half of the audience being eager, wide-eyed children. The majority of critics were enchanted. The film also received five Oscar nominations, including one for Best Picture, which it ultimately lost to a little movie called Gone with the Wind. But it did score wins for Best Original Song and Best Original Score. Despite all that, The Wizard of Oz wasn't actually a big hit. 
It cost around $2.8 million to make and only brought back $3 million. Meaning that once you add in the cost of that massive marketing campaign, the studio actually lost money. It wasn't until the film was re-released in 1949 and 1955 that it finally turned a profit. Funnily enough though, the true source of the movie's lasting popularity is actually due to television. The Wizard of Oz first aired on TV in 1956 to a huge audience and brought in an even bigger rating when it aired again in 1959. Sensing a hit, the networks began airing The Wizard of Oz every year, becoming a beloved tradition for tens of millions of Americans to this day. The life of Peter Sellers is a 20th century archetype, that of an astronomical rise from humble beginnings to international stardom. But away from the characters of Inspector Clouseau and Chance the Gardener, Sellers was a troubled man. Here are some tragic details about Peter Sellers. Famous for slipping in and out of characters and creating new ones at the drop of a hat, the character of the real-life Peter Sellers has been difficult to pin down. Stanley Kubrick described the naturalness with which he inhabited his roles in classic movies as, quote, a state of comic ecstasy, and his dynamism is shown especially in the film Dr. Strangelove, in which Sellers plays three distinct parts. But it has been reported by many biographers that Sellers found his own identity impossible to inhabit. Furthermore, in a 1980 interview on the Today Show, the actor discussed an idea that had recently taken hold that, in essence, there was no Peter Sellers. Sellers claimed that it wasn't entirely true that, behind the mask, he was an empty vessel. But the topic had recurred throughout his career, and in a famous clip from The Muppet Show, Sellers, who had hosted the show as a range of characters, told Kermit, There is no me, I do not exist. The Daily Telegraph notes, however, that the roots of his selflessness may have arisen from tragic circumstances in early childhood. Sellers was born Richard Henry Sellers, with the name Peter bestowed on him as a tribute to his older brother, who was stillborn. This sense of displaced identity haunted Sellers, but perhaps it gave him his ability to project himself so uncannily into the minds of other characters. Peter Sellers had a reputation as a womanizer, divorcing his first wife Anne, with whom he had had two children in the early 1960s. His second wife, the Swedish actress Britt Eklund, has in recent years gone on record to describe their difficult marriage and Sellers' jealous, controlling, and abusive behavior. Eklund suggested that her former husband most likely had bipolar disorder, explaining the great bouts of depression and paranoia that characterized his relationships with women in his life. Eklund was just 21 when she met Sellers, who was 17 years her senior. The actor had seen her photograph in a newspaper and decided that he wanted to meet her. The pair were soon married, with Sellers informing the press of his intentions before actually proposing to Eklund. Eklund described how Sellers would decide on almost all aspects of their lives together, including the outfits that his wife was to wear. In one incident, his abrupt decision that they should take a spontaneous holiday meant that Eklund was fired from her role in a Hollywood movie. Eklund has described how Sellers was both psychologically and physically abusive, going so far as to throw items and destroy property if he didn't get his way. After his divorce from Eklund, Sellers remarried twice more, to aristocrat Miranda McMillan and later to actress Lynn Frederick, to whom he was married at the time of his death. Peter Sellers' erratic behavior toward those close to him was exacerbated by alcohol and the drugs with which he used to experiment. Big drinking and fast-living Hollywood actors weren't exactly a rare species in the 60s and 70s, but the effects of such a lifestyle for Sellers and those around him were especially disastrous. Firstly, alcohol and drugs affected his health dramatically, with Sellers having his first heart attack before the age of 40. However, to make matters worse, Sellers wasn't given adequate treatment for a variety of reasons. As noted by The Guardian, Sellers' value to the production companies that made his movies meant that his heart issues were continually brushed off. On top of that, Sellers himself was highly superstitious and pursued a number of alternative methods when decisive medical intervention by pulmonary specialists might have had a tangible effect on his health. Coupled with the fact that Sellers did not change his lifestyle, which was amplified by the similar habits of his fourth wife, Lynn Frederick, it became a certainty that his health would continue to decline. The harrowing period, which his biographer Ed Sykov describes as, quote, Peter Sellers' deaths, began in a Los Angeles hotel room in April 1964, with Sellers in bed with 21-year-old wife Britt Eklund. Sykov's book features direct quotes from Eklund, who described the regularity with which the couple used drugs to increase their bedroom performance, particularly amyl nitrite, commonly known as poppers. The couple would take the drug nightly, according to Eklund, in pursuit of, quote, the ultimate orgasm. On this particular night, however, their adventurousness would go awry, with Eklund describing how she came back from the bathroom to find Sellers collapsed on the bed in a puddle of spilled champagne, with Sellers himself realizing that he was having a heart attack. 
Despite this, Sellers wasn't taken to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital until the next morning, where over the course of the coming days, he would suffer a barrage of further heart attacks in which his heart stopped entirely. The star was revived each time by a defibrillator. Sykov describes how on hearing the news, television crews were already working on potential obituaries. So he said I was dead for two minutes, clinically dead. And um, I, I guess I was, you know. Meanwhile, between bouts of unconsciousness, Sellers performed songs and impersonations for children on the ward. Sellers would continue to have heart issues for the rest of his life. Sellers' first marriage to Anne Howe came to an end due to his infatuation with another woman, Italian page and screen idol Sophia Loren. Sellers and Loren had worked together on the 1960 movie The Millionaires, as well as the novelty song Goodness Gracious Me, which Sellers performed in character to promote the movie. Sellers didn't exactly keep his infatuation with his co-star secret. According to Sykov, colleagues on the set of The Millionaires reported that Sellers acted boyishly toward Loren as though she were a pinup in his bedroom. Meanwhile, in the evenings, over dinner with his family, the actor could not help but pore over the details of Loren's behavior and how she treated him each day. In one incident, Sellers returned home and declared his love for Loren openly to his wife. Loren was married to Italian movie producer Carlo Ponti and would continue to be until his death in 2007. Sellers claimed to friends that he and his co-star were in the throes of a passionate love affair and that she was going to leave her husband for him. However, there is no evidence to support these claims, and as Michael Sellers has discussed, the possibility exists that Sellers' infatuation was nothing more than a fantasy, born out of the inflation of his ego from being cast opposite such a glamorous sex symbol. It wasn't just his first wife, Anne, who had to deal with Sellers' ego-driven emotional problems. His declaration of love for Sophia Loren also occurred in front of his children. His son Michael, speaking to Sykov, described a moment when his father awoke him in the middle of the night to ask him the following question, do you think I should divorce your mummy? Though the Sophia Loren saga is perhaps the most striking example of Sellers' strange lack of regard for the feelings of his family, the truth is that they acted as a continual outlet for his insecurities. In an interview with the Scotsman, Michael recalls how his father had asked him at the age of seven which of his parents he liked best. When he replied mummy, it sent Sellers into a rage. The following year, Michael says, his father wrote him a letter claiming to disown him and advising the child to take his mother's maiden name, Howe. Michael, together with his sisters Sarah and Victoria, later wrote a best-selling book about the treatment they received from their troubled and troubling father. But aside from the intermittent contact, distance, and mood swings that the three had to contend with, the most brutal treatment was to come at the time of Peter's death. Irritability, flightiness, and violent mood swings were not reserved purely for Peter Sellers' home life. Indeed, his difficult personality put great strains on his friendships and those he worked with on set. A prime example is given in the recollections of director Peter Medic, who is friends with Sellers. According to The Guardian, the disastrous production of the 1973 movie The Ghost in the Noonday Sun was so fraught with difficulties that it provided enough material for a story of its own, which Medic finally told in the form of a documentary, The Ghost of Peter Sellers, released in 2018. While arranging to work on a script with Sellers, Medic was rudely left waiting alone at the actor's house and, having gone to find him, discovered Sellers on his head, naked, performing yoga. The incident is funny on its own, but further ambivalence toward the production on the part of Sellers, as well as tantrums and arguments on set, combined with bad luck regarding poor shooting conditions, meant the movie was never given a theatrical release. Ghost in the Noonday Sun was eventually released on home video in 1985. The official biography on the Peter Sellers website describes him as an obsessive perfectionist, an aspect of his character that accounts for his genius and also partly for his difficult personality. Let's dig it. <laughs> I thought you said your dog did not bite. That is not my dog. Peter Sellers also had a complicated relationship with his mother, Peg. Peter was spoiled by his mother, which may have been related to the tragedy of Peg losing her first baby. In Tsaikov's biography, Seller's first wife Anne describes the dynamic between the pair as being formative for his later relationships with women. Peg remained close to Sellers well into his adulthood and was abnormally protective while allowing his behavior to go entirely unchecked. Some biographers believe this means that Sellers remained infantilized, expecting the women in his life to mother him. While filming the movie The Bobo in Italy in August 1966, Sellers received a phone call that his mother had suffered a heart attack. However, Sellers chose to remain on set, and his mother died within days. Her death affected Sellers deeply. In 1980, 16 years after his first heart attack, Sellers' heart finally gave out. The scene once again was a glamorous hotel. According to Roger Ebert, Sellers was staying at the Dorchester Hotel in London at the time of the attack. He was taken to London's Middlesex Hospital, where his condition worsened dramatically. Sellers passed away at 6.28 p.m. on July 24th. 
By his side was his second wife, Brett Eklund, and their daughter, Victoria, as well as his fourth wife, Lynn Frederick, to whom he had been married for only a few years. A number of tragic details have emerged surrounding Seller's death, apart from the relatively early age at which he passed away. Firstly, Sellers had been taking steps to reconcile with his children, as is indicated by the presence of one of his daughters at his death. Similarly, on the day of his heart attack, Sellers was due to attend a reunion dinner with his old friends and co-stars on The Goon Show, Spike Milligan and Harry Seacum. As reported by Wales Online, Sellers saved his last joke for after his death. He had requested for his funeral the song In The Mood by Glenn Miller, a song that all the goons mutually detested, knowing they'd have to sit through it and hopefully share a last laugh. One of the most contentious events of Peter Sellers' life occurred, in fact, after his death, and so did one of the most tragic side stories. At the reading of Sellers' will, it was found that the vast majority of the actor's wealth, said to be around $7 million, was to go straight to his fourth wife, Lynn Frederick, to whom he was married at the time of his death. So far, so uncontroversial. However, the will also stipulated that each of Sellers' three children were to receive just $1,000 each. At the time, it seemed like a final rebuke from the erratic and emotionally troubled star, although evidence exists in the form of a recently unearthed letter that Sellers was attempting to change the beneficiaries of his will at the time of his death. Frederick declined to provide Sellers three children with any more of his fortune than was allocated to them in his will, despite the pleas of Sellers' friend Spike Milligan, says Sykoff. His book also details how, struggling with addiction, Frederick died on April 27, 1994, aged just 39. Ginger Rogers was married five times and divorced five times, but were any of those marriages broken up by her partnership with Fred Astaire? Keep watching to find out. Ginger Rogers' fame had an early start and was possible all thanks to the dance craze of the 1920s, the Charleston. In 1925, the 14-year-old Rogers, then known by her birth name Virginia McMath, won a dance competition and was crowned Charleston Champion of Texas. When I won this contest, what kind of contest? A Charleston contest. The prize for winning the competition was a vaudeville contract. With the help of her mother, Ginger Rogers and her redheads was born. Ginger was a nickname which came about when a cousin couldn't pronounce her given name of Virginia, while Rogers was the last name of her stepfather. She played vaudeville stages until 1929, eventually making her way to New York City. From there, a star was born. Dancing was sometimes painful, particularly alongside Fred Astaire, who was a notorious perfectionist. While filming Swing Time, Rogers coped with extreme foot pain. She wrote in her autobiography that she kept dancing even though her feet really hurt. At one point, she removed her shoes and they were filled with blood. I had danced my feet raw, she explained. Producers recommended they stop filming, but Rogers wanted to complete the scene. They finally got what they wanted by 4 a.m. Astaire had a lot of confidence in his dancing partner. He once remarked that the other women he worked with over the years often cried because they didn't think they could make it through the routines. Rogers was the exception. According to the book Texas Entertainers, Lone Stars and Profile, Astaire said, quote, No, Ginger never cried. Astaire, on the other hand, may have had to hold back some tears during the filming of the 1936 film Follow the Fleet. Ginger Rogers wore a stunning beaded gown that weighed over 25 pounds. The sleeves were also covered in heavy beads and had a tendency to hit Astaire in the face. Rogers admitted she was, quote, completely unaware that her gown was causing Astaire so many problems. He winced and was forced to physically move out of the way while she kept on dancing. Rogers, of course, became an icon by dancing with Astaire. Ironically, when they first met on a dance floor, she didn't know who he was. I was from Texas. I had never heard of Fred Astaire. And so... It didn't mean anything to me. That's why I guess I had such fun. In addition to dancing, Ginger Rogers also had some impressive acting abilities. In 1940, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her role in Kitty Foyle. Over the next few years, she devoted much of her time to polishing her comedy routines and working for the war effort. Like many celebrities of the time, she was prominently involved in the United States Service Organization and participated in rallies to help sell war bonds. In her book, Ginger, My Story, she said, quote, We were all proud to do our part. All of Rogers' hard work and popularity paid off, as it resulted in the actress becoming the top-paid star in Hollywood in 1945. Her earnings were around $300,000, and she was the eighth-highest moneymaker in America that year. Rogers was also career-savvy. Willing to change with the time, she transitioned to television in the 1950s. She appeared in several comedies, dramas, and variety shows, which were popular at the time. And she later returned to the stage, appearing in Hello, Dolly! in 1965 and Mame! in 1969, among others. Ginger Rogers famously dated celebrities such as Howard Hughes and Jimmy Stewart, but she was unlucky in love. She tied the knot five times, but none of them stuck. 
She was just 17 years old when she married her first husband, vaudeville dancer and comedian Jack Pepper. They split after two years together. She married her second husband, Lou Ayers, in 1934, but they divorced six years later. She also married actor Jack Briggs from 1943 to 1949, French actor Jacques Bergerac from 1953 to 1957, and actor-producer William Marshall from 1961 to 1969. Despite persistent rumors, however, it's unclear whether she was romantically involved with dancing partner Fred Astaire. Either way, Rogers wrote in her autobiography, Yes, I have had some failed marriages, but I always loved being married. Caring, cooking, and being a companion with a husband were as natural to me as breathing. Despite all her relationships, Rogers never had children. Her personal assistant of nearly 20 years, Roberta Olden, told Fox News that one of the reasons why Rogers didn't have children was because she was so busy with her career. Olden also speculated that Rogers simply didn't find the right man to have children with. And while other women gave up certain things to have kids, Olden explained that Rogers enjoyed her career, so she focused on that instead. In 1936, Ginger Rogers became one of the first people to be named an admiral by the Texas Navy. What's the Texas Navy, you ask? Well, in the 19th century, it was a literal navy for the independent Republic of Texas. A century later, it had basically become a historical organization with ceremonial titles, kind of like the Kentucky Colonels. It was Texas Governor James Allred who made Rogers an admiral in the Texas Navy during the opening of the Texas State Fairground in Dallas. Rogers later wrote in Ginger My Story, I never knew Texas had a navy. Salute me, y'all. Ginger Rogers had her share of fashion moments over the years. She lived during a time long before social media influencers persuaded fans how to dress. However, she told the New York Times that when she wore a blue feather dress in the 1935 film Top Hat, feather sales skyrocketed. This cemented her status as a movie-style icon. Then, her 1940 film Kitty Foyle made white-collar dresses a hot commodity. She wrote in her autobiography, I can never emphasize enough how important clothing was to me. That was one of the reasons why she decided to partner with J.C. Penney in the 1970s serving as a fashion consultant from 1972 to 1975. Rogers handpicked clothes from the mail-order catalog and traveled around the states to help women find affordable but fashionable clothing options. The star developed a wardrobe for hundreds of stores in America. According to her book, she had a particular interest in lingerie. It was a big get for the department store because it had secured one of America's most popular Golden Age stars as their spokesperson. J.C. Penney executives chose Rogers as a representative due to her fashion knowledge and because they believed her famous gams would help the company sell pantyhose. The partnership made perfect sense because as a dancer, Rogers had kept her legs in top shape. Some celebrity watchers may be surprised to learn that Ginger Rogers not only played tennis but was a formidable opponent. In fact, she was such a good player that in 1950, the 39-year-old actress competed at the U.S. Open in a mixed doubles match with tennis player and actor Frank Shields who today is most well-known for being actress Brooke Shields' grandfather. At the time, Rogers was still a popular film star and had recently appeared with Fred Astaire and the Barclays of Broadway, so it may have seemed odd that she was competing at a professional sporting event. There was reportedly some consternation over her participation due to her celebrity status. Even so, she was a skilled player who was good enough to qualify for the event. Her former assistant, Roberta Olden, told Fox News that Rogers was a very good tennis player. She initially played the sport alongside Hollywood legends such as Errol Flynn and Katherine Hepburn, but she was looking for a challenge, and she certainly got it at the tournament. Unfortunately, she and Shields lost to a much younger team. Rogers also competed in a celebrity tournament that took place in conjunction with the U.S. Open, but she and her partner lost before the final match. Around 1940, Ginger Rogers purchased a ranch in Southern Oregon. According to her longtime assistant, Roberta Olden, she loved the ranch because it was the perfect place to relax, and it was likely a good retreat from Hollywood. She spent her time there cooking, fishing, horseback riding, reading, and skeet shooting. Olden told Fox News, She would let her hair down, wear no makeup, and just be a regular person. She loved that, too. It's very easy for me to go up to my ranch and, and can fruit. The ranch was more than just a home for Rogers and her mother, who also resided there. Her ranch provided some support during the war effort as well. Its Guernsey cows produced milk for local army men at Camp White, which was home to approximately 25,000 soldiers during World War II. Rogers was even featured on the cover of Life magazine in 1942, with the article inside offering a glimpse of her life there. She and her mother lived at the ranch for over half a century before the star sold the property in 1990 and moved to nearby Medford, Oregon. Ginger Rogers' mother raised her as a Christian scientist, and the religion was a huge part of her life. One of the ways in which she practiced her faith was by living a clean life without alcohol and avoiding the temptations that Hollywood had to offer. Her religion and relationship with God were part of her life both on screen and off. Rogers' longtime assistant, Roberta Olden, told Crosswalk.com that her faith was very important and that 
She knew that it was God's gift of goodness that shone through her performances. However, it wasn't always easy for Rogers to avoid the pressures of the industry. Privacy was difficult to attain because she was so famous, and not everyone understood her Christian beliefs. Plus, she endured several failed marriages and had other struggles that could have caused some people to quit Hollywood. Instead, she took refuge in her church and through prayer. Olden explained, I don't think there was a day that went by when she didn't thank God for something. Due to her beliefs as a Christian scientist, Ginger Rogers was one of those rare celebrities who neither smoked nor drank alcohol. She loved hosting parties but served cold non-alcoholic drinks. Her favorite was ginger ale, and one of her favorite indulgences was ice cream sodas. So it's somewhat ironic that over the years she's had at least two different alcoholic beverages named after her. Of course, as one of America's most iconic movie stars, she's in good company, as there are drinks named after many other stars of Hollywood's golden age, including Shirley Temple, Charlie Chaplin, and Mary Pickford. The Ginger Rogers is simple to concoct and a pleasant summertime cocktail. Unsurprisingly, the ingredients include gin, ginger, and ginger ale, which not only pay homage to the star's famous name, but to her personal preferences as well. There's also a different version you can get at Disneyland of all places, though it too has gin as its base ingredient. Ginger Rogers was born in Northern Independence, Missouri, a town that in recent years had made an effort to commemorate her achievements. But it wasn't always that way, and the star felt that she deserved some recognition. President Harry Truman, who spent decades living in Independence, planned a special event there for Rogers in 1964 after she complained that the residents celebrated his birthday but didn't commemorate hers. She was also honored at an event in town in 1994. The actress, who passed away in 1995, likely would have been pleased that in 2018 her former home, a registered historic landmark, was officially turned into a museum. Rogers and her mother lived on the property for four years, and the home was restored so it looked like it did when they resided there. The property also became the site of the Ginger Festival that year, which celebrated the life of a Hollywood icon. The money raised during the festival was allocated toward repairing the home's roof and upgrading the landscaping. The festival included the presentation of two Ginger Rogers films, a fan club meeting, and a presentation about the house. Unfortunately, the museum closed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly a century after its 1922 premiere, Nosferatu remains a compelling adaptation of Dracula. Setting the tone for the modern horror film, Nosferatu influenced the look and style of the genre's golden age in the 1930s and 40s. This is the untold truth of Nosferatu. The origins and unmistakable look of Nosferatu sprang from the imagination of production designer Alban Grau. According to the Fortean Times, Grau was born in Germany in 1884 and grew into a skilled painter, eventually leaving his job as a baker's apprentice to study art. After World War I, he ended up turning that passion into a job with Germany's largest film studio at the time, creating storyboards and concept art for movies. Aside from art, Grau's guiding passion was the occult. A longtime practitioner of ritual magic, Grau was a member of several German esoteric groups, and in 1921 he established his company Prana Film with the sole purpose of producing movies with supernatural themes. Prana's only production was Nosferatu, and although the film's occult elements are subtle, they're best exemplified in the scenes showing Orlok's contract, which is covered in astrological, hermetic, and alchemical symbols. In The Haunted Screen, author Lottie Eisner attempts to explain the cultural atmosphere that led to famous German horror films of the silent era such as Nosferatu and the iconic expressionist film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. As Eisner wrote, Mysticism and magic, the dark forces to which Germans have always been more than willing to commit themselves, had flourished in the face of death on the battlefields, and the ghosts which had haunted the German romantics revived. Eisner's argument that the horrors of war inspired these classic films is well-founded, as Alban Grau's vision for the film was as much rooted in his own experience with war as it was with Bram Stoker's original Dracula novel. An incident from Grau's days on the Eastern Front of World War I brought him face to face with the possible reality of the supernatural, firing his imagination and kindling the spark which would eventually become Nosferatu. As detailed in Eisner's book Murnau, in the winter of 1916, Grau was staying with an old Serbian man. The artist and budding occultist listened to the Serb tell the story of his father, who had died without receiving the sacraments and wandered his village as the undead. Grau even later claimed that the peasant produced an official document detailing the 1884 exhumation of his father. The dead man's body showed no signs of decay, and his teeth had become abnormally long and sharp, protruding over the lips. Grau claimed that the peasant told him that prayers were said, and the supposed vampire was dispatched with a stake through the heart. The bald, emaciated form of Nosferatu's vampire, Count Orlok, is among the most iconic images in the history of the horror genre. However, the man behind the grotesque makeup remains largely a mystery. 
Although volumes have been written about Max Schreck's contemporaries in silent horror cinema such as Lon Chaney and Conrad Veidt, as well as later figures of the genre's golden age like Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, the life of the man who played cinema's first real vampire has little in the way of documentation. Even Schreck's true identity has been called into question, with some sources suggesting that he was actually actor Alfred Abel, best known for his roles in Fritz Lang's Metropolis and Dr. Mabuza, working under an appropriately spooky stage name. There's even an urban legend that Schreck really was a vampire something explored in the 2000 horror film Shadow the Vampire starring Willem Dafoe as Shrek. Max Shrek was actually born in Berlin in 1879. Despite speculation that Shrek, a German word meaning fear or fright, was a pseudonym, it was indeed the actor's given surname. The son of a civil servant, Max Schreck trained to be an actor at the Berlin Royal Theater and worked extensively on the stage before entering film. Shrek died in 1936 at the age of 57, having never achieved much notoriety beyond Nosferatu. One of the most compelling plot elements of Nosferatu, and one that is not present in Bram Stoker's Dracula, is the use of its main antagonist as a harbinger of disease and pestilence. When Orlok arrives in Visborg, he brings with him a horde of plague-infected rats that decimates the population. Ultimately, the vampire's presence is secondary to the horrors that disease inflicts on the city, and it meant the filmmakers had a major challenge on their hands. As detailed in a 2020 feature published by NorthJersey.com, the producers of Nosferatu went to unusual lengths to acquire their cast of rodent extras. On July 31, 1921, Prana Film ran a newspaper ad that would lead to an unusual casting call, Wanted 30 to 50 Living Rats. The ad was apparently successful. In one of the film's most memorable sequences, one of Orlok's coffins is knocked open, unleashing a stampede of vermin. Following World War II, many critics came to interpret Orlok's plague of rats as a metaphor for anti-Semitism in Germany at the time. Although this reading has merit in retrospect, it was not the intent of the filmmakers. Alvin Grau felt the film was reflective of its era. Produced against the backdrop of Germany's post-World War I decline and the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which killed 287,000 in Germany alone, Nosferatu, in Grau's words, was reflective of the events that came together to suck the world dry like a, quote, cosmic vampire. It's a theme that still makes sense to audiences even today. Although Nosferatu has long been assumed to be a Romanian word synonymous with vampire, the term's origins present a complicated linguistic mystery. The word entered Western literature with the 1897 publication of Bram Stoker's Dracula. According to horror historian David J. Skull, Stoker encountered the word in writer Emily Gerard's 1885 essay Transylvanian Superstitions, which was later included in her book The Land Beyond the Forests, Facts, Figures, and Fancies from Transylvania. In that book, Gerard used the word as a synonym for vampire and described a creature feared by Romanian peasants. Despite Gerard's assertions, Nosferatu is seemingly unknown in Romanian folklore, and all attempts to trace the word dead end with Gerard's writing. Though various researchers have tried combing Greek, Roman, and other ancient languages, it's also hard to pin down a linguistic origin word tied to it. In 2011, writer Anthony Hogg finally discovered an earlier source containing Nosferatu. Predating Transylvanian superstitions by 20 years, the year and its days in the opinion and custom of the Romanians of Transylvania by Wilhelm Schmidt contains the mysterious word and uses it in much the same way that Gerard's book did. However, Nosferatu's true origins remain murky. Nosferatu dispenses with the artifice of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari for an expressionism that's more akin to a heightened yet nightmarish reality. Much of the film's terrifying atmosphere stems from F. W. Murnau's use of practical locations. Slovakia was chosen to stand in for Nosferatu's Romanian countryside, but filming in the rough Slovakian terrain of the mountains proved challenging. One panoramic shot required porters to carry the camera and film canisters 7,200 feet up a rock wall and hoist the equipment into place with chains. Some of Nosferatu's most memorable scenes take place at Orlok's castle, where Thomas first lays eyes on the ancient vampire. For the vampire's domain, Murnau and Grau chose the 13th-century mountain fortress Orava Castle. Today, it stands virtually unchanged and is a popular historical tourist attraction. However, the decaying remains of Orlok's castle as depicted at the film's conclusion are actually the ruins of a different castle in Slovakia. The northern German town of Lübeck served as Nosferatu's fictional town of Isborg. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, Lübeck is home to several Nosferatu locations that are still recognizable today, including the building that serves as Orlok's German home, Thomas and Ellen's home, and the cobblestone streets to which the coffins of the plague victims are carried. As an unabashed and wholly unauthorized adaptation of Dracula, Nosferatu famously drew the ire of Bram Stoker's widow. With Dracula her only source of income, Florence Stoker was notoriously protective of her late husband's copyright. 
Prana Film had gone bankrupt by the time she got around to suing them, so she couldn't get any money out of the deal. But Florence Stoker did succeed in another way. Despite never seeing a single frame of Nosferatu, Stoker sued successfully to have every print of the film destroyed. Because of that order, the horror classic was almost lost forever. Lots of films from the silent era have been lost, whether through neglect over time, storage fires, or other mishaps. As historian David J. Skull has noted, though, the Nosferatu case is one of the few instances in which someone has actively tried to destroy every trace of a film, particularly a film they've never seen. Yet Nosferatu survived. In 1925, a livid Florence Stoker discovered that a British film club called the Film Society was planning a private showing of Nosferatu. Stoker immediately attempted to seize the film, but the Film Society's co-founder was able to keep her legal agents at bay with evasion and stonewalling. That fabled print disappeared before Stoker and her lawyers could seize it, and eventually Nosferatu turned up in the United States. Through a loophole in copyright law, Dracula had always been in the public domain in America, and so Nosferatu was out of Stoker's reach. Although Nosferatu is an adaptation of Dracula, its antagonist Count Orlok resembles neither the novel's aging aristocrats nor the suave and seductive image of Dracula made famous by Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee. I am Dracula, and I welcome you to my house. Orlok is, first and foremost, an ancient monster. From his first appearance on screen, his true nature is never in doubt. Allegorical baggage aside, it's evident that Orlok is much more than he seems. As depicted in the film, Thomas discovers an old book detailing the origins and habits of supernatural creatures while staying at a Transylvanian inn. In the ancient tome, he reads, From the seed of Belial sprang the vampire Nosferatu, who liveth and feedeth on human blood. As detailed by Christianity.com, Belial is a personification of wickedness and evil. In the Old Testament, the word refers broadly to lawlessness and rebellion. However, the New Testament specifically identifies Belial as Satan in the book of 2 Corinthians. Given this scriptural context, Orlok is the literal son of the devil, or at the very least, some kind of demonic presence. As documented by Turner Classic Movies, F.W. Murnau left Germany for the United States in 1926. Brought to Hollywood at the behest of producer William Fox, Murnau's success in his home country meant he got unprecedented creative control for his first American film, Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans. Released in 1927, the film was an artistic triumph noted for Murnau's revolutionary camera work. In 1929, at the very first Academy Awards, Sunrise won three awards, including Best Unique and Artistic Picture. After 1930's City Girl, the director left Fox to make Taboo, a story of the South Seas, with documentarian Robert Flattery. Set in Tahiti, Taboo was Murnau's only box office hit after leaving Germany, but the success was short-lived. F.W. Murnau's life came to an end on March 11, 1931, when his car collided with an electric pole at high speed on California's winding Pacific Coast Highway. Murnau's body was returned to Germany and he was buried near Berlin. In July 2015, grave robbers broke into Murnau's tomb and removed the director's skull from his iron coffin. Candle wax left at the scene led to speculation that Murnau's corpse had been used in an occult ceremony. Sadly, his skull remains missing. In 1979, filmmaker Werner Herzog mounted an ambitious and thematically complex remake of Nosferatu. Starring Klaus Kinski as Count Dracula, the film presents the vampire as a lonely outsider who yearns for love and beauty. Time is an abyss, profound as a thousand nights. Though it was plagued by accusations of animal cruelty for the way the many rats needed for the film were treated, Herzog's Nosferatu the Vampire was a hit with critics, who lauded the film for its visuals and innovative take on the vampire myth. Among some horror fans, Herzog's version is considered a masterpiece in its own right, but even a century later, there's still no substitute for the original classic. Clint Eastwood and John Wayne are two icons of conservative Hollywood masculinity, but despite their similarities both on and off screen, the two never work together. Why? Here's the truth of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood's relationship. By the time Clint Eastwood came onto the scene with the TV series Rawhide in 1959, John Wayne was at the height of his legendary career. While Eastwood was sharpening his acting chops as Rowdy Yates for the next eight years, Wayne was churning out one classic after another, including The Alamo and The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. Then in 1964, while Eastwood was on a break from Rawhide, he was offered a starring role in a western with an up-and-coming Italian director in Spain. It was a fistful of dollars, and it wasn't easy thanks to the language barrier. As Eastwood recalled on Inside the Actor's Studio, Sergio Leone didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Italian, so... <laughs> I was kind of on my own. It was the first Western of its kind. The dialogue was thin, the main character had no name, and he lacked the usual charm required from the protagonist. It was a box office hit, and not just in Italy. 
So two sequels immediately followed, including the instant classic The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which redefined the Western genre. Despite its success, though, Wayne was evidently uninterested in working with Leone, at least judging by the tortured development of the film Rooster Cogburn. Though Wayne considered a number of directors before settling for the inexperienced Stuart Miller, who Wayne reportedly didn't even like, it doesn't seem as though Leone was ever considered. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood didn't meet in person until 1976, when Eastwood visited the set of Wayne's film The Shootist. Ron Howard, a co-star in the film, said that when Wayne heard Eastwood was coming to visit, he inquired about the man's politics. By the 70s, Wayne was increasingly isolated in Hollywood as a firm conservative, especially after a 1971 Playboy interview where he advocated for a form of white supremacy, saying it was needed, quote, until the blacks are educated to a point of responsibility. Still, Wayne said in an interview that he had always considered himself a liberal of sorts, even if nobody else did. He insisted that he didn't vote on party lines, but rather for the individual. Eastwood also shared this sentiment, at least from a 2020 interview with the Wall Street Journal, in which he spoke about being a libertarian as, quote, somebody who has respect for other people's ideas and is willing to learn constantly. John Wayne was originally offered the lead part in Dirty Harry and later regretted turning it down, according to John Wayne, The Life and Legend. Interestingly, Eastwood revealed on Inside the Actor Studio that he had heard Paul Newman had also been offered the part, but wasn't interested due to some of its political undertones. So Eastwood, being the next runner-up, was cast as Inspector Harry Callahan in 1971, and the film went on to be a wildly successful franchise. While the critics tore it apart for its excessive violence and glorification of a bad cop, it raked in $22 million at the box office, spawning several sequels. Of course, in hindsight, there are several reasons why Eastwood was probably the better fit than Wayne. Wayne was opposed to excessive violence in films and protested against depictions of cops bending or breaking the law. Eastwood, on the other hand, had a history of playing anti-heroes, and it didn't hurt that he also did most of his own stunts, while Wayne's health was declining. Still, Wayne said in his biography, I made a mistake with that one. Wayne didn't just meet Eastwood on the set of The Shootist in 1976. He also had to deal with Eastwood's outsized Hollywood reputation. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, the Duke was not impressed with much of Don Siegel's direction on The Shootist, and the two frequently argued. In fact, their feuding started even before the film began, with Siegel telling a reporter for the Carson City newspaper, Wayne is supposed to eat directors for breakfast, but if he tries to eat me, he'll get indigestion. Siegel also had to shoot a handful of scenes around Wayne while he was recovering from a bronchial infection. When Wayne returned, most of what the director did while he was gone was okay, except for a scene where Wayne's stunt double shot a man in the back as he attempted to run out of the saloon. Wayne was livid. According to his co-star Hugh O'Brien, Wayne said, Wait a minute, I've never shot anybody in the back and I'm not going to start now. According to Eastwood, he later heard that Siegel later tried to have Wayne ambush another villain and Wayne again refused to shoot him in the back. Siegel said, quote, Clint Eastwood would have shot him in the back, to which Wayne replied, I don't care what that kid would have done, I don't shoot him in the back. Clint Eastwood's characters undeniably shook up the format of American westerns. The straightforward good guy and bad guy dynamic became more ambiguous and therefore far more interesting. Eastwood's protagonists often fueled the plot with vengeance like in the outlaw Josie Wales. While John Wayne's were justly upheld by honorable ethics like in El Dorado, Eastwood's characters also seemed to directly reflect the new approaches to morality and cinema in the 1970s. Wayne's ideals were cultivated 30 years prior, and his convictions oftentimes appeared black and white in a full-color world. In Wayne's damaging Playboy interview, he talked about the dwindling state of democracy due to Americans' growing disrespect for authority, mentioning the Black Panthers' treatment towards police and the Vietnam War protests. He was also candid about his thoughts toward pictures that veered off course from traditional Western frameworks like High Noon. In the film, a retired marshal has to face an outlaw gang alone after the townsfolk refuse to help him. In the end, the character prevails but throws his badge in the dust before hopping in a carriage to leave town with his new wife. Wayne told the interviewer, It's the most un-American thing I've ever seen in my whole life. In fact, Wayne disliked it so much that he later made the film Rio Bravo as a direct response. But for Eastwood, moral dilemmas and ambiguous endings like the ones pioneered in High Noon were far more interesting, a thinking that led him to make unusual and offbeat westerns like High Plains Drifter and Pale Rider. John Wayne preferred working with the best in the business since he seemed to consider himself as such. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, he felt that directors needed to be as well-rounded and well-experienced in their careers as he was. For example, he loudly detested Stuart Miller, who directed him and Katherine Hepburn in Rooster Cogburn, saying on Phil Donahue, quote, he was a poor director. He then added, but kind of new around the business. And, <laughs> oh. and there's some question about, you know, his capabilities. 
This was also the case for actors, and he gave his True Grit co-star Kim Darby no slack for what he thought was a lackluster performance in the 21-year-old's first major role, despite that Wayne finally won an Oscar for the film. So what does this have to do with Clint Eastwood? Well, Eastwood began directing in 1971. His first film was Play Misty For Me, which wasn't a western. In 1973, though, Eastwood tried his hand at directing a western. The result was High Plains Drifter, which many consider to be a classic. Wayne, however, didn't, and his strong feelings about Eastwood's sophomore effort would go a long way towards defining their relationship. In 1973, following High Plains Drifter, Eastwood was sent a script for a new project called The Hostels. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, when the script for The Hostels came to Clint Eastwood's production company Mount Paso, Eastwood sent it over to John Wayne to see if he'd want to co-star in the film with him. The story, which Eastwood admitted needed some work, was about a younger guy who won half of a ranch that was owned by an older guy. The two unsurprisingly don't get along at first, but in the end have to work together to fight off a band of hostiles that come to take over the property. The Duke politely declined the offer and sent the script back. After Eastwood sent the script to Wayne a second time, though, Wayne let Eastwood have it. Rather than respond directly to the offer to appear in the hostels, Wayne instead wrote Eastwood an angry letter where he expressed anger towards Eastwood for what Wayne perceived as un-American ideals in High Plains Drifter. Wayne specifically griped that the townspeople did not, quote, accurately represent the spirit of the pioneers who had made America great. Eastwood didn't bother to write back. He told film critic Kenneth Turin, I realized that there's two different generations and he wouldn't understand what I was doing. High Plains Drifter was meant to be a fable. It wasn't meant to show the hours of pioneering drudgery. It wasn't supposed to be anything about settling the West. Still, that didn't keep Eastwood from sending Wayne a third version of the script for the hostels. Wayne was given the third draft by his son while they were out sailing, as his son thought Wayne should reconsider. Instead, Wayne said, this piece of shit again, and threw it in the ocean. According to a Wayne biography, Duke, a love story, he told a colleague, this kind of stuff is all they know how to write these days. Someone like me and Eastwood ride into town, know everything, act the big guys, and everyone else is a bunch of idiots. Eastwood never went on to make the hostels. Wayne and Eastwood also had something else in common. They both held director John Ford in very high regard. John Wayne had incredible loyalty to Ford, who taught Wayne everything he knew, from his famous walk to the charming intonation in which all of Wayne's characters spoke. Wayne even called him coach. However, Ford put a lot of pressure on Wayne, no matter the circumstances, whether it was humiliating him on set or berating him for not enlisting during World War II. But despite the tensions that ebbed and flowed between the two icons, Wayne was always loyal to Ford and openly referred to Ford's advice often when he was on other sets, from how to sequence a shot to the rhythm of delivering emotion in a scene. Eastwood was also inspired by Ford throughout his own career. During an event at the Directors Guild of America, Eastwood said that Ford's influence on directors, quote, is like osmosis, and that he watched Ford's films like Stagecoach in the theater as a kid. But for Eastwood, Ford's equations for Westerns were simply jumping off points rather than rules to abide by, as he enjoyed the depth required to cultivate heroes that weren't necessarily straightforward in their intentions or approachability. When John Wayne had his one-sided exchange with Clint Eastwood over High Plains Drifter, it was the early 1970s, when Eastwood's career was on the upswing while Wayne's was on the down. Wayne had started to take roles he wasn't really interested in, such as the title character in McHugh, for the sake of working. On top of that, Wayne's health was declining quickly. He had recovered from lung cancer after a major surgery in 1964, but then started developing heart problems. On top of that, doctors found he had stomach cancer in 1975, right before filming The Shootist. Meanwhile, Eastwood had started his own production company, Mount Paso, in 1967. In 1971, Eastwood received a Golden Globe for world film favorites. At the start of the decade, Wayne was still on top of the world, while Eastwood was just hitting it big. By the end, in June 1979, Eastwood's film Escape from Alcatraz cemented him as one of the biggest stars in the world, just two weeks after Wayne passed away from cancer. Sadly, we'll never know what might have happened if the two icons had found the common ground to work together. Frankly, my dear, Clark Gable still sets hearts aflutter. But how did the king of Hollywood's off-screen struggles with alcohol, divorce, and personal tragedy lead to his early demise? Grab a hanky and hang on. All will be revealed. The very definition of tall, dark, and handsome, Clark Gable's star glowed brightly in nearly every one of his films. With an impressive career spanning several decades, he is considered one of Hollywood's most enduring stars. Known for his charm, the charismatic actor's popularity rose steadily beginning with the 1931 film A Free Soul, which led to being cast in Frank Capra's It Happened One Night, a role that won him the Oscar in 1934. The next year, he followed up with an Academy Award-nominated performance for his role as Fletcher Christian in the 1935 film Mutiny on the Bounty, 
but it was his iconic performance as the debonair rogue Rhett Butler in the 1939 blockbuster Gone with the Wind that won him the hearts of generations of moviegoers and secured his third Oscar nomination. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. If Gable was indeed the king of Hollywood, he was a hard-working monarch, and if not all his movies were critically acclaimed, he was always a box office favorite. His sudden death at the age of 59 following the wrap of his final film, The Misfits, left fans wondering what great performances he might have given if he'd had more time. In his personal life, however, Gable seemed to have more than his share of troubles. He had two failed marriages early on. His first wife, Josephine Dillon, was his acting coach, and she helped him hone his acting abilities on his way up. But it was his second union, with socialite Rhea Franklin Langham, that made the gossip columns because of his repeated infidelities. As the war started? The marriage only lasted from 1931 to 1935 when the pair separated. They didn't divorce until 1939, however, around the same time Gable met the love of his life, actress Carol Lombard. Sadly, the Gable and Lombard love story proved to be a short one. She died in an airplane crash in 1942, only a few years after they tied the knot. Lost in his grief, Gable drank heavily for a time and even gave up acting to enlist in the military during World War II. At 41 years old, he signed on with the Army Air Corps, serving as a tail gunner, an extremely dangerous position with a very short life expectancy. In spite of his obvious death wish, Gable survived to go on to earn the rank of major. After the war, he took up acting again, but haunted by the loss of Lombard, he continued to flounder personally. In 1949, in a desperate bid for happiness, he married Lady Sylvia Ashley. A former British actress, model, and chorus girl, Ashley was the widow of swashbuckling actor Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and the divorced spouse of two different British noblemen. Unfortunately, Lady Ashley proved to be a less than satisfactory choice. Gable later confided to friends that he must have been drunk when he proposed to her. <laughs> in the final years of his life, however, Gable's personal story seemed to be on the upswing. He married actress Kay Williams in 1955. She had two children from an earlier marriage, and the couple seemed to finally have found some measure of domestic bliss. In 1960, the pair learned Kay was expecting their first child together, and Gable planned to take a break from work when their little one arrived. He had just one more film project to finish up first. Sadly, it was this movie that may have actually hastened his death. The Misfits was a high-profile film with a slew of Hollywood and literary heavyweights associated with the project. A complex, dramatic, contemporary western, it was to be directed by John Huston, with a script penned by playwright Arthur Miller. Miller's wife, actress Marilyn Monroe, was to co-star with both Gable and legendary actor Montgomery Clift. But by this time, Gable was in poor health, and working on this kind of film took a lot out of him. He had suffered one heart attack earlier in his life, and he was known for his heavy drinking and smoking habit. These problems were compounded by the drastic measures Gable used to get into shape. In preparation for his portrayal of Gay Langland, an aging cowboy, he dropped more than 30 pounds quickly with the help of amphetamines. And if this wasn't hard enough on Gable's aging body, making the film proved even more difficult. Shot on location in Nevada, its stars had to cope with the area's brutal heat, which probably proved too much for Gable's heart in the end. Don't worry, we're not through here. Not by a long shot, we're only getting started. The Misfits required some reshoots, and Gable had to work an extra three weeks on the film. After the project wrapped in early November 1960, he and his wife went back home to Encino, California. Soon after arriving home, however, Gable suffered a heart attack on November 6th. The star was taken to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital for treatment and seemed to be doing okay, but only 10 days later, Gable died suddenly in his bed, only hours after having dinner with Kay in his room. The nurse with him at the time reported Gable was sitting up one moment and gone the next. The doctors suspected yet another heart attack. Gable was only 59 years old. Gable's death made newspaper headlines around the world, as fans mourned the passing of one of everyone's favorite film stars. It is ironic that The Misfits, which was released in 1961, also proved to be the final performance of his co-star, Marilyn Monroe, another screen legend who died from an overdose of barbiturates in 1962. In a final personal tragedy for Gable, he never got the opportunity to see his son. The child he was so eager to welcome into the world, John Clark Gable, was born four months after his father's passing. In the end, Gable was laid to rest beside his third wife, Carol Lombard, at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles. 
Clark Gable may be gone, but like the consummate performer he was, he left his fans wanting more. Goodbye, Clark. The King is dead. Long live the King. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. 1-800-662-4357. Hardly anyone can think of classic Hollywood without recalling actress Grace Kelly. She wasn't in very many films, but Kelly had a huge impact on Hollywood and on the world. Here's the tragic story of Grace Kelly. Grace Patricia Kelly was the third child born into a wealthy Irish Catholic family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Kellys were never fully accepted into high society despite their substantial wealth. If someone had the good luck of being wealthy around the early to middle part of the 20th century, they still had to have the right background to be welcomed among the upper class. Unfortunately, it didn't matter how much money a family had if they were of the Irish Catholic persuasion, as many elites still gave them the cold shoulder. According to the Washington Post, Grace's father, Jack Kelly, was not one to be put out. If he wasn't going to be accepted among the Philadelphia mainline elites, he would have just as luxurious a mansion as any aristocrat. So he built an elegant family home in the East Falls neighborhood of Philadelphia. Jack was the son of Irish immigrants and made his fortune in the construction trade during the post-World War I boom. He was also one of the rare few unaffected by the 1929 market crash due to him never investing in stocks. Grace Kelly came from a wildly athletic and sociable family. Her father, Jack, was a three-time Olympic gold medalist in rowing. Her mother, Margaret, was a model and a competitive swimmer. Kelly's father expected all of his children to be just as extroverted. But according to Vanity Fair, Kelly was shy and introverted. She suffered from asthma and sinus problems as a child, much to her father's disappointment. Grace's serenity made her stand out from her siblings, but that wasn't enough to interest or impress her father. Her siblings weren't sympathetic to her relationship with her father. According to one story, her sister Lizanne one time locked her in a cupboard. Rather than try to escape, Kelly simply stayed in the closet and quietly played with her dolls until someone discovered her hours later. Grace Kelly's family was disapproving when she announced her intention to become an actress. According to biography, her father most notably was displeased with his daughter's career choice and said that an actress was a slim cut above a streetwalker. But as biography notes, her uncle Walter Kelly was a successful vaudeville performer, while her other uncle George Kelly was a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. George was one of the actress's greatest influences and became her primary mentor and confidant. It was thanks to her uncle's guidance that Grace Kelly learned the ins and outs of Hollywood and was able to gain admittance to the American Academy of the Dramatic Arts in Manhattan. Grace Kelly tried not to rely too much on family relations or money to advance her career. Her parents didn't want her to move to New York, but Kelly was insistent. According to Vanity Fair, she even covered her own tuition by taking lucrative jobs as a commercial model. Kelly also had to lose her Philadelphian accent and get control of her sinus troubles, which she tried by taking diction lessons and wearing a clothespin on her nose. Her newly refined accent was the subject of some mockery from her family. What's the matter with me, Mark? I don't seem able to feel anything. After a few roles on Broadway, Kelly decided to try Hollywood. Vanity Fair stated that she took great care with her appearance when attending auditions dressing conservatively and ladylike, and even wearing white gloves, highly unusual in the Hollywood world. But it worked. Her biggest break arrived when Gary Cooper discovered her during her first film, 14 Hours. Cooper then had her cast as his wife in his latest film, High Noon. Cooper's endorsement put Grace Kelly on the road to stardom. She went on to another major motion picture, Mogambo, alongside Clark Gable, and later won the Academy Award for Best Actress for The Country Girl. Kelly also became a favorite of director Alfred Hitchcock, who notoriously had a weakness for elegant blondes. Grace Kelly seemed to have a particular type when it came to her romantic choices. She was constantly cast as the romantic interest of men who were usually more than 20 years her senior, which played a role in her real-life relationships. According to Vanity Fair, Kelly had a two-year romance with one of her instructors, Don Richardson, who was 11 years Grace's senior. He was also Jewish, something that wildly aggravated Kelly's notoriously anti-Semitic father. Family pressure put an end to the relationship. Kelly was said to have had many affairs with her older male, sometimes married, co-stars. She had been linked to romances with major actors such as Clark Gable, Bing Crosby, Ray Milland, and Frank Sinatra. At one point, she dated Prince Ali Khan and almost married fashion designer Oleg Cassini. Kelly's love letters to Cassini were discovered and printed by Harper's Bazaar many years after her death. The details of her romantic dalliances are still a point of interest. Grace Kelly met her future husband, Prince Rainier III of Monaco, at the Cannes Film Festival while promoting To Catch a Thief. Country Living stated that it was through actress Olivia de Havilland that Kelly was formally introduced to him. 
At the time, de Havilland was married to Pierre Galante, the editor of Paris Match magazine. After meeting Kelly on the train from Paris to Cannes, de Havilland asked Kelly if she would be interested in a personal meeting with Prince Rainier. De Havilland said many years later in an interview with People, Grace struck me on first encounter as a rather reserved, self-possessed, well-brought-up young woman. After getting approval from MGM, Grace agreed to meet the prince. This initial first meeting would spark a correspondence between the two, which later resulted in their engagement. Kelly fell in love with the prince while she was filming The Swan, where she played a young princess preparing to become the wife of a European king. MGM also filmed the couple's royal wedding in 1956 and broadcast it across Europe. Grace Kelly found a love match with Prince Rainier III, but some have wondered whether there was a mercenary aspect to the marriage. According to The Telegraph, Prince Rainier came to the Monaco throne in 1949 after the devastation of World War II. He not only inherited a principality, but he also had to deal with the country's financial issues. Rainier decided to make Monaco a tax haven and made it look more appealing to foreign millionaires, tourists, and businesses. But the unmarried Rainier needed his future wife to bring a tidy sum into their marriage, and a beautiful Hollywood actress could bring the money and the publicity to Monaco. Kelly wasn't even the first actress on Rainier's shortlist. According to the Chicago Tribune, at one point, Rainier had an interest in Hollywood cover girl Marilyn Monroe. A letter was sent to her from Rainier, but Monroe ultimately turned him down, not fancying herself the princess type. Also, Monroe was beginning her romance with playwright Arthur Miller and was eager for more serious film work. But Rainier eventually met Kelly, who had the looks, the prestige, and the cash. As it would turn out, becoming a princess wasn't as charming as it's hyped up to be. For Grace Kelly, the actual path to princesshood was far from a fairy tale, according to the Chicago Tribune. Why don't you want a place like this? Palaces are for royalty. We're just common people with a bank account. In order to marry and become a royal of Monaco, Kelly would unfortunately have to give up her acting career and renounce her U.S. citizenship, a hefty price to pay to marry into international royalty. Since money was a concern for Monaco, Prince Rainier insisted on receiving a dowry for Kelly to have the privilege of marrying a prince. The asking price was $2 million. Despite having the money, Kelly's father wasn't thrilled about paying for his beautiful, famous daughter to get married. But the prospect of a royal in the family and all the benefits were too good to pass up. Father and daughter agreed to each pay half on the dowry. Kelly also had to submit to a fertility test to prove that she could produce heirs. Nothing says fairy tale like an invasive and uncomfortable medical procedure. That's exactly what was running through my mind. The reasoning behind the test was that Monaco still had an old agreement with France from 1918, which dictated that if Monaco had no heir, the principality would be returned to French rule. So, as invasive as a fertility test was for Kelly, for the royal family, it was a necessity. Kelly agreed to the medical exam, and once she was in the clear, the wedding could proceed. Prince Rainier may have had a vested interest in marrying a beautiful starlet, but that didn't mean he had any admiration for the acting profession. Grace Kelly's Hollywood fame brought significant and valuable publicity to Monaco, but Rainier disapproved of Kelly's former career. He viewed it as an undignified profession, particularly for a royal princess. He seemed to share similar sentiments as Kelly's father, regarding acting as too common and naive of a practice. According to The Guardian, out of concern that Kelly's movies would negatively impact the image of the royal family, Rainier banned all of his wife's films in Monaco for years. Although Kelly agreed to give up her career in order to become a princess, she still missed acting and wished she could return to her profession. In 1962, she tentatively tried to stage a comeback. She was about to sign on to play the titular role of Alfred Hitchcock's upcoming film Marnie, but the public outcry in Monaco was overwhelming. And it wasn't just that she would be acting again, but the fact that her lead character in the Hitchcock film was a criminal. The people of Monaco shuddered at the thought of their refined, elegant princess playing the role of a common crook. According to Vogue, Grace mourned the loss of her on-screen career for the rest of her life, even telling the Los Angeles Times in 1964, I miss acting. Once you're bitten with the acting bug, you never really get over it. Grace Kelly had three children with Rainier, Princess Caroline, Prince Albert, and Princess Stephanie. Yet Kelly seemed to struggle to connect with her children, possibly as a result of her royal duties and responsibilities. In recent years, after both their parents had passed away, Princess Caroline and Prince Albert revealed in interviews, as reported by Insider, that they weren't particularly close to their mother. Caroline and Albert were only a year apart and grew up with a close bond, and shared a nanny, Maureen Wood, with whom they felt more of a parental connection than with either of their parents. They preferred their nanny so much that they would cry when Wood was away on her annual vacation, and Kelly would ask Wood if she could come back to work early on occasion. Caroline and Albert added that they were not even allowed to eat dinner with their parents until they were 14 years old. Even Grace, by her own admission to ABC News, said that she was a hard disciplinarian to her three children. She wasn't above lashing out or speaking harshly. Kelly stated, 
we sort of tend to think that knowledge is a substitute for discipline and it never will be. Uh, our children were brought up with a certain amount of discipline. And unfortunately wasn't much different than Kelly's own authoritarian mother who raised her in this way. The news of Princess Grace of Monaco's death took the world by shock. According to the Independent Ireland, Kelly had been in fine health at 52 years old as far as anyone knew. Kelly was driving her 17-year-old daughter Stephanie to school in Paris one day when tragedy struck. The details of what precisely happened are hazy, but it appears that Kelly took a sharp turn on a steep mountain turn that caused the car to shoot down a 120-foot slope. Stephanie only sustained minor injuries, but Grace suffered a brain hemorrhage. She died on September 14, 1982 at Monaco Hospital. It was later renamed Princess Grace Hospital Center in honor of Kelly. Kelly's eldest daughter, Princess Caroline, assumed Grace's role in the royal family. After her death, Prince Rainier established the Princess Grace Foundation in the U.S., an organization dedicated to financially supporting emerging artists in theater, dance, and film. Prince Rainier never remarried. He was buried beside Grace after his death in 2005. At her funeral service, co-star and lifelong friend James Stewart said of Kelly, Grace brought into my life as she brought into yours a soft, warm light every time I saw her, and every time I saw her was a holiday of its own. Nose jobs and false teeth and diet pills? Oh my. The golden age of Hollywood hid some dark beauty secrets, along with a small army paid to make the era stars picture perfect. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Marlena Dietrich first graced the silver screen with her bedroom eyes and cutting cheekbones in the early 1920s. She made a name for herself in films like The Tragedy of Love, The Ship of Lost Men, and Der Blau Engel, which was the first talking picture film in Germany. When she wasn't seducing the public with her sultry voice, she was adorning her face in surgical tape and topping the look off with a tight, high ponytail in order to achieve those iconic cheekbones, per Marie Claire. Like most beauty techniques, this strategically positioned ponytail meant to draw her cheekbones in an upward position came at a price. The look, which became known as the Croydon facelift, is said to cause permanent hair loss over time. The hair loss was likely not a big deal to the star, who was rumored to have also surgically removed her molars to achieve and maintain her famous facial structure. There has been much ado about racial discrimination and the harmful perpetuation of stereotypes during the golden age of cinema. What's spoken about less, however, is the whitewashing of actors hailing from minority backgrounds. Take for example Rita Hayworth, who held the old Hollywood title of The All-American Girl. Marie Claire reports that in order to achieve this prestigious title, Rita Hayworth, whose birth name was Margarita Carmen Cancino, had to shed much of her Latina heritage. This included her name and also her hairline, which was originally a full inch lower on her face. After some extensive electrolysis treatments and applications of lighter hair dye, Hayworth's transformation was complete. This might have been a hair-raising experience, but it was in no way unique to Rita Hayworth. Marilyn Monroe is said to have undertaken similar procedures to remove her widow's peak. When they signed a contract with a major studio, Hollywood icons of the past were forced to undergo what Rack refers to as identity-shifting transitions. They would be given an image that they would have to maintain in every sense of the word, from the physical to the moral. In fact, leading entertainment corporation MGM Studios had approximately 52 cosmetologists on hand to ensure their strict standards were met. Stars endured facial contouring procedures using gelatin and putty. They had their freckles removed with harsh chemical creams. There were false teeth, porcelain dental caps, and pancake makeup manufactured by Max Factor to present themselves as flawless. Even male actors were in on the gig, donning false mustaches and phony muscular physiques. According to Harper's Bazaar, beauty was so sought after in the early years of Hollywood that the phrase, looks over talent, became a backstage motto for most. Well, Gil, how do I look? Hey, you look all right, Red. Don't sound so good. In 2017, authors Angela Cartwright and Tom McLaren published Styling the Stars, Lost Treasures from the 20th Century Fox Archive. The book is an entire stockpile of photos exposing vintage Hollywood stars for exactly what they were perfect individuals just like everyone else. Camera tricks as crafty as any Instagram filter were often used, but if all else failed, plastic surgery was literally and figuratively on the table. The Independent details the history of plastic surgery, which actually predates both vintage Hollywood and even anesthesia, as painful as that sounds. By the turn of the 20th century, cosmetic surgery companies had stepped on the scene, promising surgical enhancements for several ailments, the most notable being ill-shaped noses. Rhinoplasty, a method used to reshape a patient's nose, was in full effect in the early 1900s. Procedures wherein skin grafts were taken from the arm and redistributed to shape someone's nose were less talked about, but they most certainly happened. One particularly stomach-turning example of rhinoplasty consists of a patient's nose being injected with scorching hot paraffin
in wax and then molded like a sculpture on the face. In worst case scenarios, the wax could cause cancer or permanent disfigurement of the face. Some stars are believed to have still taken the plastic surgery risk, such as Marilyn Monroe, whose posthumous skull x-rays suggest the cartilage on the tip of her nose had been reshaped. Drug use was a dark secret that eclipsed the golden age of Hollywood, but not all drugs were used to alter an actor's state of mind. They were also notoriously used to alter their appearances. The most well-known example of this is perhaps also the saddest. For the film classic blockbuster The Wizard of Oz, young star Judy Garland was force-fed copious amounts of harmful pills in order to keep her weight down and her energy up. Why, my little party's just beginning. Biography reports that Garland died at age 47 due to an overdose as a direct result of a substance use disorder, which many believe started with the studio. This very same struggle was common among other stars who were also encouraged to take dangerous drugs to maintain their trim, on-screen figures. According to history, 50s actor Joanna Moore was prescribed mood and image-altering amphetamines for weight loss, which a Hollywood doctor elusively described as vitamin injections. Dr. Lee Siege of 20th Century Fox spoke candidly on the subject years later, telling Marilyn Monroe biography Anthony Summers, pills were seen as another tool to keep stars working. The skinny on those weight loss tactics only gets worse. Harper's Bazaar reports that weight control wasn't optional for these classic vintage stars. It was built into their contracts, further driving the incentive to go to drastic, sometimes deadly lengths. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. 4357.